the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining. You start to install the neurological hardware to look like you already did it. The rehearsal process changes the brain to look like. When someone's looking for abundance, it's never about the abundance, it's about the change they need to make for no, healing? No, the, the ch what, I'm using healing as an example, yes. but let's use abundance as an example. Yes. When, when you understand that you cannot get abundant, when it's no longer about the game called abundance, it's about the game called change. Mm -hmm. What do I need to change? The more I change, the more I'll be abundant. Yes. So then it's no longer, at, well, I haven't, how come it hasn't happened? That's the old personality, separate mm -hmm. from the experience, still in lack, asking that question. Which is creating your current reality. Which is, which is reaffirming it because that's the lens you're perceiving it through. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so we should be focusing more on what we need to change every moment as opposed to the abundance or the healing. Well, the word meditation means to become familiar with. Sit with yourself long enough and not turn on your cell phone, not yeah. scroll through your social media, and do no TikTok, no emails, no, none of that stuff. Don't Just sit and close your eyes and, and watch the thoughts that come up. Those, that's the exact reason why you're not abundant. Watch what you want to do when you're feeling lack to take away the lack and there's always something you would do to, to take it away. But, but sit with the lack and be curious on what's on the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the body's programmed into lack now subconsciously, right? So the emotion of lack drives our thoughts and drives our behaviors. So it makes sense then that if an emotion is a record of the past, then we're doing things habitually from the past. Mm -hmm. We're thinking in the past, right? So, so lower the volume to the emotion every time you notice lack comes up. And just like breaking any addiction, there's going to be cravings, right? So the body's going, <laughs> yeah. hey, Lewis, it's been about two hours since you're you You're so thought, used to doing this yeah, thing. Yeah, you've been thinking lacking thoughts about 150,000 times a day, and you're just going to stop now. <laughs> the, body's going to, the body's going to start influencing the mind and saying, yes. it's not going to work. You're a loser. It didn't work before. It's too hard. Or everybody else. That's, that's why it's so hard for people to like lose weight or get in shape. Same, because you might this, try it for a few days, and then the cravings, or I'm tired, and I want to go default back into the old personality. Right, because why? Because the body, which has been conditioned the mind, the body is the unconscious mind. So the body's got used to the familiar feeling. Even mm -hmm. They don't even know it's lack. It's just how they feel. So it's not guilt. So, okay, right. so let me finish. How does so, yeah, okay, so the hardest part about all of this is making a different choice. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Right. It's going to feel unfamiliar. Your, your body's all of a sudden saying, hey, Louis, uh, why don't you start thinking those same exact thoughts, mm -hmm. do the same things, make the same choices, demonstrate the same behaviors, have the same experiences. So you could feel that feeling of lack. Complain again to somebody, call somebody up and say how, how miserable your right. life is, right? right. And that's, that's the known, right? So the body is always influencing the mind to return back to the familiar territory. The default. Yeah. The default, okay. All right, so now the person says, okay, what thoughts do I not want? What, what, would an abundant person think this way? The people in our work that have created, mm. I had a guy come to our event. I, I love this guy. He healed himself. Of, he, he tried to take his life three times. When he, he told me that when he came to our work, he didn't have $2 to rub together. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars wow. now. And just keeps giving it away. Wow. His, his lesson, his lesson was, and that wasn't the wealth, it was who he became. So it's the overcoming process that is the becoming process. Right? Who did he become in that journey? Exactly. He had to get beyond all of those thoughts of his past, all the mistakes he made, all the things he did wrong, all the money he owed there, all of that. That was like, he just had to no longer be that person any longer. Mm -hmm. But he did say, how would a wealthy person live? And, and, and when he created his wealth, what do you think the first thing he did? Started giving? Giving it away. Why? Because an abundant person doesn't have any lack. Mm -hmm. And he knows how to create more of it. And that's, he's in the experiment. Well, what would happen if I keep giving it away? He keeps getting more. That's a good experiment to have because he is actually living in that abundant state. He also had tremendous healings taking place because when you heal your heart, you heal your mind. I mean, it's just the way it is. We saw it so many times, right? So he healed his heart. He got an wow. upgrade. He got an upgrade, right? Yeah. So then the, the next fundamental question is, how would an abundant person think? Write it down, dude, and fire and wire those thoughts in your brain and install the hardware. 
keep doing it with attention and intention, it becomes the new voice in your head. It becomes a software program. Then say, okay, how am I going to be in my life today? What would an abundant person, how would they behave? And before you reach for your cell phone and start scrolling through your social media, close your eyes and rehearse in your mind how that person would walk, how they would breathe, how they would smile, how they would mm. greet people, how they would be on Zoom calls, how would they be in traffic, how would they be at dinner? And, and the act of closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing the act, mm. if you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining. In fact, just a little bit of time, you start to install the neurological hardware to look like you already did it. Now the mm -hmm. brain is no longer a record of the past, it's primed for the future. Keep doing it, keep rehearsing. No different than playing an instrument, no different than learning how to dance, no different than learning how to act uh, or play a sport. Everybody's mm -hmm. always rehearsing, right? The rehearsal process changes the brain to look like you've already done it, you've already experienced it. Now what's the essential part of that? The hardware is in place. Now all you gotta do is step into the footprint, mm. keep doing it, it becomes a software program. You start acting like an abundant person. Everything changes, your energy changes, your mood changes, the way you walk, the way you breathe, your posture changes, you're out of the known, right? Yes. You gotta condition the body now emotionally into the future. Can't open your eyes in the morning until you are feeling worthy to receive. And if you can't feel worthy to receive, then if not now, when? Mm -hmm. If it takes you two hours to get there, ask me if it's worth 30 years of running, trying to get what you need matter to matter. Okay, so then the person who wrestles with their lack, they're out of the bleachers and they're on the playing field. Yeah. Now, here's what we learned. Here's what we learned. Let's go back to beliefs now. So remember, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again. A belief is something that you keep thinking enough times that you hardwired in your brain and it becomes an automatic program. And we have beliefs about all kinds of things, money, relationships, God, whatever it is. It's all based on what we've been told or our past experiences, right? The boundaries of those beliefs are our emotions, right? So let's just say you got betrayed or somebody abused you or mm -hmm. your father told you that money was bad and there's never enough of it or whatever. That's a story, okay? But, but somehow it left an impression on you. Remember that event very clearly and that's kind of rooted in who you are, right? Okay, so that emotion then is the boundary of our belief, okay? So how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. If you take a thought and a feeling, 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 that's called an attitude. A series of good <laughs> thoughts with a series of good feelings, you say, I have a good attitude today. You have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to a series of negative feelings, you say, I have a bad attitude today. So attitudes are just shortened states of being. Good attitude in the morning, bad attitude in the afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you keep those up, and you string attitudes together, you create what's called a belief. Mm -hmm. And a belief is just an extended state of being. So if you keep thinking the same thought, you keep hardwiring it in the brain, you keep feeling the same feeling, you keep conditioning in your body, the redundancy of that cycle over and over again conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind of that belief. And all beliefs are subconscious states of being. Mm. Okay. Take a belief, a belief, a belief, and you string them together. You form what's called a perception. And perceptions are just such extended states of being that we're unconscious. And so then we, we edit out reality. In fact, most people don't see things the way they are. They see things the way they are, yes. right? And people are always filling in reality unconsciously based on their memory. They could be married to a person for 40 years and they don't see the person, they see the memory of the person, right? Mm -hmm. And there's research to prove this, okay? So how do we change a belief or perception about ourselves or our lives, okay? We've studied this. Okay, let's just say that lack is ingrained in there. You got the story, you lived on the streets, you lost everything, you got betrayed, your business partner took everything, took your wife, took, you got the story in the half, yes. okay? Okay, you gotta start telling a new story of the future, right? You gotta believe in that future more than you have to believe in the past. So how do you do that? Mm -hmm. You only believe in the past when you feel the emotions of the past. The only time you're gonna believe in the future is when you feel the emotions of the future, right? Okay, so in order for us to change a belief or perception about ourselves and our lives, we have to make a decision 
with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in uh -huh. your brain and the emotional conditioning in your body. And your body literally has to respond to your mind. That the choice that you're making to change <laughs> in that moment becomes a moment in time that you never forget. And here's the key. Physically. Physically. The stronger the emotion you feel when you make that choice, the more you'll remember the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then how do we downregulate that old belief? If the trauma created an emotional quotient of six or seven, then your decision to change your beliefs has got to be a nine. Right. And you've got to come out of your resting state, and that moment has to define you. You could say, I know exactly where I was, the time and day it was, who I was with, when I made my mind up to change, mm -hmm. right? Because you created a long-term memory. Long-term memories are created with from strong emotion, emotion. Yes. right? But if the amplitude of that emotion is greater than the betrayal, boom, the body starts responding to the mind. And you're actually giving your body a taste of the future emotionally. So you brand your- What's possible. No, your body's actually getting the taste of that future event. It's experiencing the future now. Now, exactly. It, Big yeah. explosion in the quantum field. Wow. Big explosion. So the side effect of that is if you combine that clear intention with that elevated emotion, you're basically remembering your future and it looks no different than remembering your past. Think neurologically within the circuits of that memory and feel within the emotions of that new belief and watch your life begin to change because nothing changes in our life that we change. And when we change our energy, we change our life. So now the experiment all of a sudden is no longer based on it being hard or trying or wishing or wanting mm -hmm. or hoping. That's what we do when we're lacking or in lack or separation. It's about change. So then when we finally realize in order for us to become abundant, we have to overcome the old personality. And that's 95% of who we are, right? Yes. So then the side effect of the beginning of this process is a lot of discomfort. <laughs> it is a lot of discomfort because you're stepping outside the known into the unknown and now you can't predict. It's scary. No, no, it's you'd, ra you'd rather so hold on to your lack. The pain, the suffering. Rather tell the story of that. At least it makes you feel something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. When you step outside and you're saying, I'm not gonna complain about money any longer. I'm not gonna complain about I don't have any. I'm not gonna judge other people who do. I'm not gonna say I can, I'm not worthy. It's never gonna work. All those things gotta go. I'm not gonna feel lack. I'm not gonna feel unworthy. I'm not gonna feel separation. I'm not gonna feel resentment. These are the things that are keeping my reality the same. Now it's no longer about abundance, about who you become. Mm -hmm. So the overcoming process becomes the becoming process. And so many people come to this work, they want abundance, they want healing, they want a new relationship, they want a new career, they want the mystical, but really they want wholeness. And, and they want healing, they want peace. They want they wholeness. Want because they feel unwhole. Well, well, when you're in lack or you're in separation, you're not whole. Mm. Imagine feeling so much wholeness that's impossible to want. That's what, our, that's what we're working on with people. Then you can really enjoy a sunset. Then you can really enjoy a meal. Mm. Then you can really enjoy your friends. Then you can, I, 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 I talk to people that are very abundant. I mean, in the billions abundant. And you know, so many of them say, we are in misery. We're, in our whole. we're in agony because they can't enjoy life anymore. That's what they want. I mean, people want abundance to be able to enjoy life. They want to be able to do whatever they want with whoever they want as many times as they want wherever they want. That's freedom, right? Or people want abundance. The sponsoring thought is really they want freedom, right? Or whatever their sponsoring thought would be, right? So, so then creating from the field instead of from matter to shorten the distance between cause and effect requires that clear intention with that elevated emotion, coherent brain and coherent heart. Tune into that energy and feel it with your brain and your heart. I mean, we have plenty of ways to do that. Examine your personality and examine your personal reality. Change your personality, change your personal reality. Don't make it be about abundance, mm -hmm. make it about becoming abundant by overcoming the person who's not abundant. The person who heals themselves from a health condition, who's no longer thinking the same way, no longer acting the same way, no longer feeling the same way. You ask them where that disease is when they stand on the stage in front of 1,500 people or 3,000 people, and that's a four-minute mile. Everybody's leaning in. That's truth right on the stage. They say, where is that, 
Where is the disease? Oh, it lives in the old person. Wow. I'm, I'm somebody else. That, that, yeah. That's like, that's, the, I don't even, that's not even the story. That's not even who I am any longer. So lo and behold, when we do our research and people do this in seven days of going all in, at the end of seven days, their body looks like genetically with all the metabolites that they're literally in a different environment. You know, here's the weird part. Mm. They're in a ballroom. Right. There's not a lot happening in a ballroom. Right, right. What's happening in a ballroom? I've been to thousands of ballrooms. Yeah. But the environment somehow looks like they're living in a very prosperous, very healthy, very loving, nurturing, very whole environment. Why? Because they were signaling genes ahead of the environment. Mm -hmm. And if the environment signals the gene, okay, that's epigenetics. The end product of the experience in the environment is an emotion. If you feel the emotion before the experience, you're signaling the gene ahead of the environment. And genes make proteins. And proteins are responsible for the structure and the function of your body. Look at, Jack by, the, look at Jack, by the way. I like that. <laughs> look at the muscle over here. <laughs> the expression of proteins is the expression of life. So you actually become abundant. Mm. You actually become that person. And people who are truly abundant have no problem with losing things. Every thought has a frequency. Every thought produces a chemical. So if you keep obsessing about your lack, your lack of finances, your lack of time, your lack of energy, lack, 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 and, and those thoughts. I don't have this, I, I don't need know, this, What, I what are this. the chemicals you're feeding your body? You're taking thought, it's producing a frequency, and that frequency in the form of chemistry is storing that thought emotionally right in your second center. You feel guilty, you feel unhappy. The moment you feel unhappy, then you generate more thoughts equal to that feeling, which makes more chemicals, and you keep taking energy from the brain and storing it in the body. If you react to people in your life and you feel anger, frustration, whether it's traffic, the news, whatever it is. Parents, you, parents, whatever, boy, girl, yeah. what, you're drawing from this field, this electromagnetic field, you're tapping that resource and you're making chemistry out of it and the field shrinks. So now, mm. by doing that and living in survival, the body no longer is a magnet. So now you have very little energy in the brain. In fact, 5% of the energy is in the brain and 95% is stored in the body. Now the body's been conditioned emotionally. So a lot of energy in the body, very little in the brain. Mm. So in our work, do we want energy to be in the brain? We want to move energy back up to the brain. So what does that do when we move the energy from the body to the brain or the heart? Well, this is a great thing because once it makes it here, it's going up, oh. right? So we do these different meditations and these different techniques to draw that energy right up to the top of the head. Now, when this energy shakes loose and it starts to move, the sympathetic nervous system switches on. And instead of releasing energy out, like you're being chased by a predator or you're, you're having an orgasm, that same energy is going up into the brain and the brain switches on and it goes into these very high, high frequencies called gamma brainwave patterns. Now the person has an arousal, but the arousal isn't fear. Not an orgasm. Well, in the brain. An, an, an orgasm of the mind. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's energy that's being that released into the brain mm. and you can only describe it as ecstasy or bliss. So the energy of guilt that was stored from thinking and feeling in the same way releases and it travels up to the brain and it's going back. And when it reaches the brain, what happens? You get more energy in the brain and it begins to produce that external field. So you're, you're beginning to create a field around your body. You can imagine the future as opposed to staying in something from the past. Well, so. once the energy's moved, you're, you're, you're going to feel, you're gonna feel pretty blessed in that moment. In fact- So we can transfer guilt, shame, insecurities can, into bliss? Oh my God. Yeah, we do it all the time. Momentarily? Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, we do it all the time. And the, the amazing thing is that that rush of energy that's moving into the brain is changing the brain's physiology and producing that field. Now you have energy to heal. Mm. Now the body is a magnet again. And it's as the energy moves up the spinal cord and it starts passing through those spinal nerves and there's a lot of dynamics going on on the body, that energy that was once stored in, in that one of those energy centers that's released is energy to heal, energy to create a new future. You're replenishing your field and now the body becomes more of a magnet instead of an inert piece of metal with no charge, right? So the person then who's 
reacting to whatever person or circumstance in their life. The stronger the emotion that they feel towards politics, towards the traffic, towards their girlfriend, Social towards their media, ex, whatever. whatever, the more they're paying attention to it. But where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So we also know that when... It's hard to create from a place of putting attention towards negative energy. Well, you're not creating. What you're doing is you're tying up your vital life force. Mm. You're giving your power away to that person or that circumstance that you could be using to create a new life with. So when a person's sitting in their meditation, and I love doing this, we just had an event in Marco Island. I'm gonna take people further than where they normally go. I know they're gonna go, oh, well, I'm done with my meditation. No, you're not done. We're gonna take you to that point where that feeling is so in your face and you can't turn on your cell phone. You can't get up and walk away because a thousand people are not getting up and walking away and you're part of the community. You're sitting in the fire and you have one of two choices. You can let that brain run on, on programs and hardwired mm -hmm. patterns and you, the arousal will drive your brain further out of balance or you'll practice the formula. And as you lower the volume to that emotion, you're gonna take your attention off that person or problem, guess what? Here comes energy back to you. You're taking your power back. And now you're building your field that way. And when that happens, energy starts to move up into the heart. Once mm -hmm. it makes it to the heart, it's going to the brain. So we start seeing people there. They, their hearts naturally open up. And all the things they thought they wanted when they came to the event, they no longer want because they feel like they have it. They don't need it anymore. Because well, they feel like they, they, they've got the feeling before the experience. So that they feel so whole that they no longer want. And, and they're not looking for their future anymore. You only look for it when you feel lack. Mm. When your body is conditioned emotionally into the future, why would you look for it when it feels like it's already happened? Now, this is where it gets weird. Because now <laughs> things start coming to you and you're no longer in need. And hey, when you're... it comes to you, you go, oh, here. Take it, I don't want it. I just, thought, I just wanted to know that I could create it. And people create a lot of wealth in our events. Yeah. And the first thing a lot of people do is they say, I'm buying a cruise for you. I'm buying you your car. Oh, mom, I'm getting you that house. Why do they do that? Because they're so excited. <laughs> they feel so amazing and they're thinking, I could do this again. Why would a, a person in lack wouldn't give? A person who's abundant would give because they know how to create. So mm. now the game changes. It's no longer about the self. Mm. And you, you're, you're doing it because that you know that you can create it. So, so then maintaining that state, when you're in love, yes. when you're in love, in love, in it, in your in body. It, you are in love. Not in another relationship. No, you're not looking for it. You're, you're, you're it. not looking for it. You'd be in lack. When oh. you're in love, there's nothing to do. You're in love. You're 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 the magnet. You you are it. And so you that are love. Yeah, so the events that come into your life would not only be just a reflection of a relationship with someone that you wanted to be intimate with. You would have meaningful loving relationships mm. that would enhance that feeling and when it didn't you would say, "Ooh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if this is right for me." You would you would trust that cuz you worked really hard mm -hmm. to nurture this, to protect it, to grow it, uh, to, to trust it again, to open up, right? It takes a lot to do this. But we see men in our work. I was on them this week. I, I never let up on those guys. Mm. Big, macho guys. You want to be, you, you want to know what courage is? Let's go. Let's open that heart. And when they start cracking open, I mean, we see people heal from yeah from colon cancer and from angina and all, just boom, there it is, there it's not. That's, what, that's what's been stored all down here. Once they open this up and it moves, the body is transforming in that moment. Mm. It's, the, the system is informing itself. Information is being restored back into the body. So when you get to that point where you, you when you're in lack and separation, time gets really crazy because mm. you want stuff to happen faster and it feels like it's taking forever. That's because you're in separation. When you're in love and you're in connected, you don't want the moment to end. I mean, I had four, three guys over for dinner last night, all these academics. I cooked a meal and a half for these guys, took out great wine, why? I wanted them to be so caught up in the moment mm. that they forgot that we made a new memory. We, made a, we had a great experience. And life then is about experiencing it. Yeah. In love, like I'm not going to be guilty of what I'm, what I'm eating or judge what I'm eating if I've cooked a great meal. Let's eat because the guilt is worse mm. than whatever it is you think is bad for you. So then 
when you're feeling those elevated emotions and you're locked in love, then, then you see life through the lens of love and there's compassion. Like uh. you could look at your greatest adversary, the person that threw you under the bus mm. and you've overcome yourself and you've done the work. They've stolen from you. They're trying you to talk bad about you behind your back. Trashing they've... on you, all that stuff. You'll look at them and you'll see a part of yourself that you used to be that you no longer are and you have nothing but understanding and compassion wow. for them. Like, wow, I just, I feel for that person. They're, they're hurting. They're struggling. I used to be like that, but you're no longer that. When you're that, then they push your buttons. When you're not- <laughs> You're reactive to that. Because you're equal, but you're, when you've overcome it, why would you do that? You would see them as somebody struggling, just like you see a child who's throwing a tantrum, just like, oh, they're gonna get Now here, I mean, I've got so many questions around this, but one thing quickly, how often do you find yourself in reaction mode when someone throws you under the bus, whether it's someone honking at you in a car and you say, ah, this, how often do you get back to that place? And like, cause we're, aren't we conditioned to kind of react? And Dude, respond? I react every day. So I react, do? oh my God, I react every day. But the fundamental question is how long are right, you gonna react? Right, right. So shortening the refractory period of your emotional reactions is that kind of intelligence where we're keeping ourselves out of the past. Mm -hmm. Justified, valid or not, the only person that that's affecting is you. <laughs> and then you have to ask yourself, is it loving to me? Well, if you can't control that emotional reaction, then you're a junkie and you're on a bad trip and you're overdosing. Mm -hmm. But if you know that you're overdosing, you gotta get beyond your rational mind because you'll say, why are you this way? Oh, because I should have. All right, by, by you doing that, is it making more of those chemicals? Yeah, why were you doing that? To make you feel more like it's, it's justified. Mm. So then, this takes, listen, I, I excuse myself many times in one day. Because you'll be, I'm in reaction mode, I'm like, let me step I'm like, aside. Are you, like, I'll be like, are you kidding me? What, who, what did they do? And then I'll be like, I'll, we're not gonna make a decision in this, in this state. state. So give me a minute. Oh, wow. I go. Take a few breaths, get out of that state, remember my future, where I'm going. It's so much more important than the present moment. I just gotta condition my body into that future. And now it takes sometimes a Herculean effort, I have to tell you. You, <laughs> can, you, feel, you can ask my staff. I'll be in my I'll be in there 15, 20, 30 minutes. Sometimes I'll say I worked, it took me an hour. But to get, to get what, back to a peaceful state. In the expanse of all eternity, if I don't overcome that emotion then I'm in my past and that's karma because that emotion is gonna drive my behaviors and thoughts and I'm gonna be predictable. My past yeah. is gonna look, my future is gonna look a lot like my past. So if I'm soulfully on the journey, mm. then what matters the most is being able to learn the skill of mm. self-regulation. So in our, in our events, when we see people that can do brain and heart coherence, they know the formula. Well, I look at their brain scans and I'm like, Lewis, great brain. Hey, you got, you can, I, I see you can hold that heart coherence for 45 minutes. Great, now let's put you on a pole at 55 feet in the air. <laughs> let's get a heart rate monitor on you and let's see what you're gonna do up there. Mm. Do you wanna be able to self-regulate there? Because if you can there, it's not like I'm trying to give you an adrenaline rush. Actually, I'm trying to do the opposite. I want you to settle your brain and body back down, go against thousands of years of programming like fear and teach your body in that moment how to regulate. I guarantee mm. you, if you go a little further than what you did and you stay conscious, instead of throwing in a program and rushing through it and trying to get it over with, you start breathing, you start getting back in your heart, you start getting centered, you work against those chemicals. I guarantee you when you walk into your life, you're gonna, the moment you see something you're doing, you're gonna catch on right away, you're gonna catch yourself. Now that, that saves you a lot of energy and a lot of time. Because if you're able to change it then instead of four hours later where you're just yeah. gone. Or you've already reacted. Yeah, and, 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 and you've, you've done things you said, I, you say I should have never done that, I should yeah. have never said that. That's what those emotions do because those emotions make us really primitive. I know that healing can happen in an instant. So how, what's the thing that triggers that instant for someone to go from disbelief to belief and it actually transforming them in the physical body? Yeah, we've studied this and, and there's no linear correlation because think about this. That woman uh, is a pragmatist. She knew nothing, she not, wasn't spiritual in any way. She just read my books and then started practicing the meditations. Now, 
she was practicing those meditations for months before the event because she wanted to come and be fully prepared for it, yeah. right? So, so from, the, from the outside, you see this one, one uh, moment. Yep. But what you don't see is the number of times she worked in overcoming herself in getting beyond whoever she is and getting into that place where she's far enough outside familiar territory, neurologically, chemically, genetically, that all of a sudden she connects it to clicks. this. She yeah. connects. There's a, she starts connecting to that invisible field called the quantum field and, mm. and you can't connect as your body. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing uh, physical to connect to there. Yeah. You have to get beyond all your associations. You know, it's interesting. I think I might have talked to you about this last time. That I grew up in a religion called Christian Science that talked a lot about this. Mm -hmm. You know, I w it was embedded in my mind that I'm a spiritual being and that I can never be physically f hurt. Like, there, I'm not a material body that there are no accidents, that there's no injury. And it was always embedded in my mind that I can never be physically harmed or I, I can be instantly healed. And so my entire childhood, I had all these incredible healings quickly. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed it all the time from other people and everyone was always like, how is this possible? Yeah. So I don't know if this is something I was practicing, you know, right, in, right. A different, in a different way as a child, but it's, it's always fun for me to come back around now, even though I don't practice that, that religion necessarily anymore or go to the church. I still believe the same sure. fundamental principles that I hear you talking about in a, in a more scientific way. It's a good belief to have. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you program children like, yeah. you program your children that the body has an innate capacity to heal. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, you're less reliant on something outside of you mm -hmm. to, to make something go away Medicine inside of you. Or something else, Whatever yeah. it is, shopping, yeah. video game, everybody's relying on their outer world relationship, to, relationship yeah. to change their inner state. Problem is, is the moment you start feeling emptiness or lack, your brain is going to start to look for something outside of you to mm -hmm. take it away. The problem to fill the, the hole, yeah. Right. The problem is, is that normally the stimulation that's created from those outer things uh, give the body a rush, and so the receptor sites and the cells recalibrate. So you need more the next time to turn it on, right? So now it's tough. You buy the new fancy car, and it's fun for and the novelty a month, wears off, right? And then it's a yeah. week, and then yeah. it's a day, and you're yeah. like, it's never enough. And that feeling never goes away, and so. The only way that feeling is actually going to go away is when you start going inward, mm -hmm. right? And so, so we've seen significant mm -hmm. changes with people, and, and having that belief, uh, it, it should be tested. On yes. a, uh, we should test our belief around that. And, and my lesson through all of this is that I'm starting to realize how conditioned we are into believing how limited we are. Mm -hmm. And as you start peeling those layers away, and you break through those beliefs, those self-limiting thoughts and emotions, on the other side of that is where the miraculous happens. So you got to be willing to be in that place of discomfort long enough to reorganize order and mm -hmm. begin to create more coherence. And then all of a sudden, you get this recalibration that goes on in the brain and body. And then the extent of that is that the ultimate thing is you start to see feedback in your life, those synchronicities, those coincidences, mm -hmm. those opportunities. You're scratching your head going, Everything's falling into place. Yeah, I'm in the right place at the Everything right time. Everything I think about just comes to me. Because your energy is synchronized. Yeah. It's, you, look, I mean, when you have coherence in the brain and heart, you have a laser of energy and it could read information much better. You're living in stress and your brain is shifting its attention from one person to another problem, to another thing, to another uh, place to go. Each one of those things, there's an assignment of neurological networks in the brain. So the arousal of the stress hormones drives the brain yeah. into this high frequency and you're trying to control and predict everything in your life. And those, your brain circuits are firing like a, like a lightning storm in the clouds. When your brain's incoherent, you're incoherent. And, mm -hmm. and you, can't, you don't have a signal. You're, you, you don't have a Wi-Fi signal. You're not connected to the field. How could, you, how could you connect to energy and information if your signal hasn't become orderly? Mm. So that when people synchronize their energy into coherence, they can synchronize to a possibility in the future. And the synchronicities that are feedback mm -hmm. from the environment are just a reflection of your energy. Mm -hmm. And that's the universe saying, follow the breadcrumbs. Do it again. Follow it again. Do it again. And now all of a sudden the person's not waking up in the morning like, oh, 
I gotta meditate now to create my future. They're they're kind of going like I'm getting out of bed because I don't yeah. want the magic to end, right? right. They want to they want to sustain that state so that the old reality that they've lived in begins to transform into something new. And because there's no longer a vibrational match with everyone and everything in their past present reality, mm. there's a vibrational match to their future, and mm. now their future is starting to give them signals. Do our What's more powerful than our thoughts or our, our emotions? And do our emotions change our thoughts or do our thoughts change our emotions? Yeah, the answer is yes. The answer is both. I mean, um, thoughts uh, to me produce an electrical charge in the quantum field and feelings produce a magnetic charge in the quantum field. Mm. Thoughts, wait, thoughts produce a what? An electrical charge. Okay. And feelings produce a magnetic charge. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out, now think about this, and the feeling draws the event back. So you mm. could have the intent that you want wealth, you want health, you want success. That's your intent, that's your thought. But if you're waiting for the experience to happen, to feel it, then you're not drawing the experience to you because you're not feeling the emotion, right? So then teaching people once again how to balance their thoughts and feelings because you can, you can enter that cycle either place. Sometimes we do a meditation, we start opening our heart, we start elevating the body's energy, and then those emotions can drive certain thoughts of your future. Mm -hmm. Other times, you open your awareness, you create brain coherence, you have the vision of your future, you begin to emotionally experience it. However you want to jump on that cycle uh, and then sustain it, because the longer you're conscious of that energy, the more you're drawing your future to you. So then, most people spend their lives, right? They, we live in this realm called space-time, three-dimensional reality, and you move your body through space in three-dimensional reality, it takes time. Yeah. So everything, all your goals, all your dreams, all your visions, you're gonna have to get your body up and drag it through space every day to pay off that, you know, that home that's in your future, right? right? When you create from the field instead of from matter, when there's a vibrational match between your energy and some potential, and your thoughts and feelings are coherent, now you are going to begin to collapse time and space or the experience is gonna be drawn to you. Now, now you're the vortex to your destiny and now you don't have to go anywhere to get it because you're not playing by the rules of three-dimensional reality, you're playing by the rules of energy and the quantum. Mm. So teaching people how to do this and getting better at it, then all of a sudden they're not forcing and controlling outcomes. In fact, they're trusting and surrendering to outcomes because they don't want to get in the way because the moment you start trying to predict when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, you're overlaying a known over a place where there should be an unknown, right? So teaching people how to do that means we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater mm -hmm. to occur, mm -hmm. right? And so that transcendental moment is something that we're working on demystifying. And, and you could be a gluten-free person, you could be a gluten-full person. You could drink wine, not drink wine. Right. You could be rich, you could be poor, you could be any color, any shape, any size. In fact, you can't tell me you're too old to do this work. You can't tell me that. We got elders in this work that we, we show you their brain scans and you'd be blown away. Mm -hmm. they, they, they know how to do it. You can't tell me you're too sick to do this work. We got people that have reversed stage four cancer numerous times. And, and yeah, it took a Herculean effort to do it, but they love themselves for it. You can't tell me that you're too out of shape or too overweight or too underweight. You can't, I've seen it in all shapes and sizes. You can't even tell me that you had a brutal past. I mean, people that have had very, very mm -hmm. dismal pasts that are free, that are happy people. You can't even tell me you're, you never meditated before. In fact, our research shows that many people have never meditated before have the most profound experiences because they're not trying to make anything happen. Yeah. They're just following the instructions, yeah. right? And, and they don't have a habit of doing it. So, so we don't want to exclude anybody in the process. We want to include everybody. So it turns out that our events tend to draw a, a good portion of men because of mm. the science. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of children now, that are, you know, teenagers that are coming and people in their 20s. We have a great community of elders. We have, uh, you know, in our events, sometimes 63 different 
cultures wow. coming to, uh, uh, to countries coming to our events of between 50 and you know 65 so so we want to we want to make it so inclusive that community becomes the side effect because yeah. because with a community of like-minded like like en similar energy of, of people uh, everybody understands they get one another you yeah. know you you Communities tends to be the thing now that, in terms of our uh, social media and, and uh, the feedback we're getting, everybody wants more community because you get a you get a thousand people in the audience and their energy is synchronized. Now you're talking about something so much bigger. We're just going to measure this. I just talked to a researcher yesterday. We're going to measure a thousand people when they reach that synchronized moment when they're we can we know that the entire social coherence in the room is orderly. Then if you're producing a ambient, coherent magnetic field in your heart and you're tuning into a thought or an intent and you got a thousand people doing that and your energy is going to start interfering mm -hmm. and co-mingling with the person who's next to you, when that energy starts to synchronize, it's going to produce a bigger wave. Mm -hmm. The higher the amplitude, the higher the wave, the more energy there is. So now you have one mind and one heart. And now when it comes to healing others, and we've done the research on this now, and we're collecting the data that we're teaching people how to administer a change in energy in the person that's laying there. Because it's not matter that emits a field, that's the wrong way to think about it, it's the field that creates matter. You change the field, you change matter. You're not, mm -hmm. It's not your job to change the tumor. The right. tumor's the illusion, it's the pattern in the field that's, that, that has to be changed. So once people start reversing this, then you start seeing tumors disappearing. You start seeing blind people seeing, deaf people hearing. You start seeing people with Parkinson's disease switch on. I mean, you start seeing stage four cancers reversing because now they're, you're, you're, you're swimming upstream. You're going to the headwaters and making that change. So pushing the envelope and then seeing that in a community, when a community is synchronized towards the second half of a week-long event, I mean, as I said before we started the show, I, I'm more surprised than, than anybody when we witness some of these things. It's crazy. What is the, we talked about, I heard you say consciousness a couple of times. What's the difference between mindset and consciousness? To me, consciousness is awareness. Awareness is paying attention and noticing. And so 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of unconscious uh -huh. automatic programs that we've just practiced so many times that we're not consciously thinking about those. So in order for you to change, to answer the initial question that you asked, the first step is you gotta become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. And you gotta, you gotta start looking at those hardwired thoughts that, that you think every day that are just circuits that have been fired and wired together. How do we do that? Should we t write a list at the end of the day or what are the most common thoughts we have that day? Like how does someone become aware of thoughts? You don't have thoughts? to do that. You just have to sit down, close your eyes and not move. And then you'll get you'll you'll start seeing. What am I thinking about right now? Yeah, yeah. and all you want to do is observe the thought uh -huh. because <laughs> when you begin to observe that thought, you're no longer the program now. You're the consciousness uh -huh. observing the program, and you're starting to pull out of the thinking program. Of the, thinking about the thinking. Yeah, who's doing the thinking of the thinking mm -hmm. about the thinking? That's who you are <laughs> when you're not the program. Right. That's awareness, right? Yeah, yeah. You got to become aware of how you speak, how you act, become so conscious so aware of it that you won't go unconscious and let that thought or that behavior run you. You gotta say, oh my God, this feeling that I've been living by for the last 20 years is actually guilt. I didn't know mm. it was guilt because it just feels like me. And all of a sudden, as you start becoming conscious of it, you're beginning to objectify your subjective self. You're, you're pulling out of those programs and nobody likes to do that because it's uncomfortable. They'd rather turn on their cell phone, start texting, get on the internet. Uh, you know, watch TV to distract them from that mm -hmm. moment, and that is what they have to move through in order to get to their to, to their own personal freedom. So, the first step is becoming conscious, and m meditation means to become familiar with, to become conscious of, to to become so conscious of your unconscious self that you won't go unconscious to any thought, any right. behavior, or emotion, and get ready because it takes a tr tremendous amount of energy to do that and awareness to stay conscious. To stay conscious. Mm -hmm. And so we fall from grace. Yeah. Fine. You got you got you're awake, you got another day, let's go again. How often do you fall? Oh my gosh. I mean 
<laughs> How many times have I done it? Thousands, but I'm not yeah. going to give up because the moments in which I do connect or the moments that I do have that transcendental experience, what matters the most after it, when I have that transcendental moment, I look back at all of those difficult meditations, those difficult days, and those are the ones you remember. You don't mm -hmm. remember the good meditations. Mm -hmm. You remember the ones where you came up against yourself yeah. and you went a little further. And you said, I'm gonna go a little further, I'm gonna go a little further. Or you had a rough day and you just went in and you just, you, at the end of the day, you surrender and you have the classic, oh my God, moment. There's no linear correlation. It's just whether you're willing to live in creation instead of living in survival. And so um, you get better at it. You know, we just get better at it. And, and for me, um, staying conscious and staying aware and staying present is an art because mm -hmm. you, you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you. You know when they're not present with you because they're not paying attention to you. So imagine this field of information, this, this, this intelligence that lives within you and I that's governing everything material in this world. It's a self-organizing intelligence. You have access to it, so you better get present with it mm -hmm. as well as you can get present with anything else. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. It, that, that, that realm you can't experience with your senses. You can only experience with your awareness. So then people have to take their attention off their bodies and go from a somebody to a nobody. Mm. Take their attention off the people in their life and go from that they identify with and go from a someone to a no one take their attention off the things in their life, their cell phone, their computer, their car, and go from something to nothing. Take their attention off where they sleep, where they work, where they're sitting, and go from somewhere to nowhere. Mm. Take their attention off the predictable future and the familiar past and time, and go from some time to no time. And now if you're taking all of your attention off of everything material in this three-dimensional reality, now there's only one other thing that's left. That means you're in awareness, your consciousness. And now, that is the bridge, that is the door mm. to the quantum field, and you can't enter the quantum field as a somebody. So, wow. if someone has spent their whole life working on having the perfect body, or so much so they have so much attention on their pain, where you place your attention is where you place your energy, it's going to take some work for them to take all of their attention off their body, right? Because they'll go, they'll do it, and then they'll go back, let's see if the pain's still there. Yeah. Oh, the pain's still there. So. It's a little bit of a waltz in the beginning, but as people start applying this, you start getting better at it. As an example, we had Bond University, a uh, uh, university in Australia on the, on the Gold Coast. A uh, senior researcher took the large majority of my brain scans, and they had, she had them analyzed by her graduate students, and they, they statistically looked at everything. One of the most startling things for the research team was our community's ability to go to to get to that point where there's nobody, no one, no really? thing, nowhere, no time. Now I'm talking four seconds. I'm talking five seconds. I'm talking nine seconds. Just like, just give me a second. I know how to do this. They, they've practiced it enough times that the creative moment is when you get beyond yourself, mm -hmm. when you dissociate from everything known in your material world. Turns out when you do that and you start changing your brain waves, your brain waves slow down into alpha and theta, you're suppressing the memory bank of the known self that keeps you plugged into three-dimensional reality. Mm. When you quiet down this mechanism, now all of a sudden you start connecting to that field. And when you can stay conscious in those subconscious realms, when you can literally regulate and change brain waves, now you're in the operating system where you can make those significant changes. So we now know that when people apply the formula and they do that properly, now they're walking through that door where they're ready to create from. In other words, you can't create from the known. Mm -hmm. You can't create with your body. That's matter trying to change matter. And you can do it, it's just gonna take a long time. Right. But when you create from the field instead of from matter, there's a whole different set of dynamics that takes place. And, and why not push that envelope to see, okay, if we've done this, we've done this, is it possible to do this? As an example, we do these wonderful healing circles where you see these dramatic instantaneous changes. So the person who's healed themselves of some health condition, when it comes time to heal somebody else, that's, they're gonna say, well now I understand the science, I understand how this all works, I know how to get beyond myself, I know how to open my heart, they start piecing it all together, let's take the formula to the next level. Now they witness a significant change in a person's body in real time, right there. So then the next question is, okay, like this happened many times, as an example, 
the woman who was at the event in Mallorca, Spain, uh, her brother had a massive stroke uh, in, uh, in Colombia, and she went back to Colombia, and he was in a coma for two weeks. Mm. She called up the healing circle and said, hey, can we do a healing on my brother? Now, if you're playing by the rules of Newtonian physics, three-dimensional reality, you're going to say, well, you need to be in front of the, the guy in order to heal him. But if you understand that there's no separation in the quantum, that there's, everything's connected when right. you're in that place, so wouldn't that be the next application of the formula? So they go over the science, they get it. Okay, we don't need, we just need a picture of him, and that's our coordinate. And if we're in the field... You're sending a frequency to that coordinate. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're not sending it anywhere because there's nowhere to send. There's no mm. space and time it's there. You're connecting to it. You're connecting to it, exactly. That's a great, great way to say it. In one hour after that coherence healing, he comes back to consciousness. Wow. Now, that's the extension of where we're going. You see, now, now, now we're progressing. A woman who was in one, uh, who, uh, one coherence healing group is a pediatric nurse in, uh, in Children's Hospital in Seattle. And again, witnessed the amazing miracle after our event in Toronto. Mm. She comes back and there's a little, they call them friends, there's a little guy failing. Doctors hit him with the paddles, they use all the, all the drugs to bring him back, and they walk out of the room and they say, we, we lost him. She walks over, puts her hands right in the field, and this kid comes right back online. Wow. Doctors are like, what was that? And now, so we have... The, a lot of our interest now is, I want to get 50%. One out of two people, we're collecting the data in this coherence healings. When we're 50%, we're going to walk into a children's hospital. We have three children's hospitals right now that are interested in us. We'll show them the data. Mm. We'll show them the results. We'll say, we don't want any money. We'll never even touch the kids. All we want to do is just change their lives. And when we're 50%, we're going to start doing it in children's hospitals. And, and we're gathering the data right now. That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, what else, would we, what else would we want to do with it, yeah, right? Exactly. It's yeah. amazing. Do yeah. you have kids? I do. You have I kid. do. How old are your kids? My kids are uh, in their 20s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they're all older and on their way. What do they think about this work? Well, my oldest son, uh, well, first of all, my kids have grown up with this work. Yeah. So you have to imagine, like, uh, my oldest son coming back to one of my advanced workshops three years ago and my friends saying, hey, is this your first advanced workshop? And he kind of glances over at him and says, I've been in the advanced workshop for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? So my oldest son is one of my team leaders. Uh, mm. He's got a master's in engineering. He lives in, in Denver, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's passionate about the work. Uh, he met his fiance at my, one of my workshops. Uh, cool. And they're very, very similar. Uh, my daughter lives in London. Uh, and she's got her master's in art at the Royal College of Art, and wow. she's probably the best creator I have ever met in my life. Mm. I mean, she's just wired. She knows how to do it. And my my youngest son is uh, goes uh, is getting his degree in architecture uh, at Cal Poly, and they're all at different stations uh, in their understanding, but they understand the principles. And mm -hmm. and I've always said to them, you know, if you can figure this out early on the rest of your life is going to be magic, right? Because yeah. you know what to do. And, and they're pretty wired for it now. And, and I've really worked in setting up conditions uh, in their lives uh, so that they can apply uh, these principles from an early age. And now that they're, they're older, um, I think that uh, they understand uh, how to do it. I'm curious your thoughts on, I have two questions. One that just came to me. What is your, what do you think, if you could predict the future about what is coming of, in terms of discoveries in this work that mm -hmm. you're doing in the next 10 years? What's, think, what's yeah, possible for yeah. us to even go even farther yeah. than you're seeing right I think now? We'll, I think we'll have a very strong intervention in cancer. Intervention in like, cancer? Yeah, yeah, we'll have some really important data to show people that, wow. that they, they can turn that around. We have too many case histories and we have too much really good data right now. I think we'll, I think we'll change uh, a lot with people that have chronic pain and inflammation. We're, we have great data to change anxiety and depression without any exogenous substance. Uh, PTSD, we have great um, results with that. Uh, our, our coherence healings where we're healing other people. Uh, blind wow. people are seeing. I mean, deaf people are hearing. I mean, uh, people with paralyzed limbs uh, are lifting their arms above their heads again. I mean, this is after 10 years of being... That's great. So, we, I mean, I've seen... If you ask Joe Dispenza, 
two years ago. Do you think you'd be seeing what you'd be seeing? That'd be like no. maybe once or twice. Those are, it's just, we had so many people step out of wheelchairs at our events. I mean, it happens. It's happening over and over now. Over and over again. It's, 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 it's just part of the collective consciousness. Interesting. And I think more than anything else, Collective networks of observers determine reality. Mm. And who controls the information, the right information, controls reality. And so my job, my interest, is to give people the information to empower them to be the creator of their life and not be stuck in the program that they mm. need someone or something or to make them happy or to change their state. I mean, people are doing it all the time now. And that's just who we are as human beings, right? So when you say collective network, uh, I'm curious, can a group of people influence healing in another person? Yeah, yeah. Easily. Like if they're all no, in a certain no. state of oh, yeah, yeah. emotional yeah, my answer, belief? My answer, no, no, yes. my answer is 100%. You a yes. thousand, is it a thousand no, people? No, no, just, eight, it... just eight, seven, six people with one person. And what would that group of people need to be thinking, feeling, being? Oh my God, you have to come to, to an event, bro. I'm, you, I'm have to be... <laughs> you have to come. It, it, it's just like hitting a golf ball. Just learn the formula and get really good at it. And we have people that are really, mm. really good at it. They I'm can master hit a, the stuff. They can hit a target. They, in fact, they they have very little disbelief that they could do it. Right. And so, that belief so, causes them to create. Right. But yeah. what we discovered, it's not the number of people with the most amount of emotion, the most amount of energy. That's you got a stadium full of people, and that's that's very entropic energy. It's the collective network that's sending the greatest signal. That's brain and heart coherence. Now that's information, right? That's what seems to entrain uh, matter. And it's learning how to send that signal with the right energy. Yeah, and right? it's just training. In seven days you go all in. I can tell you at yeah, the end of seven days you'll be different. I can I'm tell you that. For this. Yeah. I'm curious. I mean, mental health seems to be, you mentioned kind of anxiety, depression, and and these different states that people could come in with, especially people with trauma from the past, mm -hmm. whether it be ex-military special forces, people mm -hmm. that see and maybe have to do certain things that they're not excited about and that has these traumas. Prisoners. Prisoners, yeah. yeah. Mental health just seems like something everyone's talking about with the rise of a lot yeah. of things. COVID, depression, social media, disconnection, all these different things. What is your stance? Technology. On technology, yeah. Just the feeling connected but not connected, all these things. What's your thoughts on healing these mental health challenges or we diseases. have really yeah so we have really good data uh, uh, primarily for mental health conditions like PTSD anxiety depression cyclic mood disorders you know OCD things like that but when it comes to psychoses you know we just we just stay away from that because yes. it's, it's a pathology at that point and you know people can come but they have to stay right. on their medications sure, and they sure, have to, sure. you know they this is just just a little bit different game but people have more depressed states more we have brain scan after brain scan the show that you could change that in you can short, change it really sure so is this so like so like so like trauma it, like if you don't know, and again, I don't know everything. Yes. But what I do know is that when the brain starts functioning in a level of order or coherence, more neurons are recruited and bigger communities. And that kind of holism that's created is so important. The other thing we realize is that when people really heal their heart, they heal their mind. Like mm. there's no... I have no doubt about that. You cannot do one without the other. And when there's enough energy in the heart, and we we've seen this, we've we've got the we've got the technology to see that when the heart starts working, when people start doing it properly, there's this low frequency in the heart that starts to rise. It's only indigenous to the heart because they have their attention on it. Uh. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So they're filling the gas tank up, and when it gets to a certain point, here comes the parasympathetic nervous system saying. Get out of the stress response, get relaxed, and then all of a sudden you think that would be over. But it's not, then the parasympathetic nervous system drops down and the sympathetic nervous system comes up. And when the sympathetic nervous system comes up, now the person's relaxed and awake. Like they're really relaxed in their heart and they're really awake in their brain. That state is so much better than being stressed out and unconscious <laughs> and in a program, right? So it turns out, when you get to that state, when the heart starts informing the brain, it resets the baseline for the trauma 
that's stored in the brain, in the amygdala. It's informing the brain that the event is over. Mm. Because the emotion that they're feeling is dragging the body out of the past, yes. right to the present. And when they feel that glory, that really rich feeling where it's like, oh my God, this is something I haven't felt since I was nine years old or six years old. And it's this familiar feeling in their heart. The words many people use blows wide open. When they look back at their past, their trauma, the loss, the betrayal, the abuse, sexually, physically, emotionally, so many times the person doesn't want to change one thing. Why you know? is that? Because it brought them to this moment. And now the moment is okay and all of that's okay because I'm okay. And they look back at their betrayers and their abusers and they have nothing but compassion. They see the, they see the whole thing. They're seeing their past from a greater level of consciousness, right? So, so now that it resets the baseline yes. and the event is over and there goes the endometriosis. There goes the suicidal tendencies. Wow. There goes the rashes. There goes the gum disease, whatever it is. Just, just the body gets an upgrade. It's no longer believing it's in the same trauma 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year because they're living unconsciously or subconsciously in that emotional program, right? So, so then, so then what, happens to, what happens to that person? They belong to the future now. They no longer belong to the past. And so it's almost like they don't even have wow. to do much now. It's almost like they're happy for no reason. <laughs> and, and they're okay with themselves. Yes. And when you're okay with yourself, you're okay with everybody. That's just the way it is, right? So you, this one woman told a story. How she had a lot of abuse in her life, mm. a lot of abuse by a lot of family members. And um, she was in her meditation and, and she thought, I'm, I'm doing this all wrong. Like she, the amount of emotion just came out of nowhere. And she was about ready to give up. And then she thought about the nine months or year, however long it was, where she never missed a day of doing her meditation. And she said it was just like, it was such a horrible feeling that she didn't think she could go any further. And then she just said, I'm just gonna go one more time. And she just went right past it and then heart blew wide open. Wow. Literally reborn, literally a different person. Like, like every biological condition that she had, every uh, 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 mental health condition. Gone. All the, all the supplements, all the drugs, all that stuff gone away. And so then the question is, what happens when the chemo isn't working? What happens when the radiation isn't working? What happens when the surgery didn't work? What happens when the, the ketogenic, gluten-free, vegan diet didn't work? What, what, what now? Right? What now? Because the cancer researcher on the stage with stage four sarcoma, she, she did all the drug and trials. She was a researcher. Reached cancer research. And she had the cancer. Had the cancer. Nothing was working. She did all the drug trials, all the chemo. She tried the, the rare, vegan. Rare, she tried the this. Everything. The rare, rare gene. The 1.001% 1, 1. of the population. She's a physician. She's a researcher. She made sense to her. No cancer in her, anywhere. Not in her bones any longer. I mean, not, 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 out of the bones. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you, you ask any physician. If something metastasizes to the bones, you're pretty much going to be with that for right. a long, long time. All of a sudden, it's gone. Like you know, so like again, those kind of things, those four-minute miles, uh, give people permission to step yeah. into that same same footprint. So what is the point when all those other things aren't working? Mm -hmm. And it only means one other thing: it's not going to work unless I change. And nothing changes in my life until I change. Right, and that's the. Thing that people start to understand. It wasn't about her healing. It was about her disbelief. It was about her emotions, that she mismanaged her emotions under too much stress. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh my God, nobody's worth this. Like nobody is worth this. This is not loving to me. I got to stop this. I understand now what I'm doing to my brain and my body by doing this. Like, big moment, right? And you look around and not a lot of other people are thinking this way, but you come to an event and everybody is. But mm -hmm. out in the world, you know, it's just the, the, the program is like, you need something out there. That didn't work. We have something else for you, right? So that's a, that's a lot of taking our power back, you know, in those circumstances. I'm curious your thoughts on this. I've never done this. I have tons of friends that have done this. Um, ayahuasca and other types of mm -hmm. medicines, right? Yeah. Or um, plant medicines, I guess they call it, right? Mm -hmm. 
been invited a bunch of times. I know a bunch of people that do this. Um, I've just never done it. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on plant medicines in terms of helping you heal or, yeah. or can it really help you or is it more a crutch or... Yeah. Here, here's my thought about it, and it's a, it's a tightrope for me to walk this. I think that a lot of plant medicines uh, fit into the same receptors, uh, serotonin and melatonin, and they tweak the brain to fire in a different way, which gives us an altered perception from outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. which for a lot of people, we need that. Step away from where you, you're, you're at. You're just seeing situation. reality from a different dimension. Yes. You're, not, you're not seeing it from you. You're seeing it from a different place. And, and for some people, that journey is painful and it creates nausea and vomiting. And, you know, and some people kind of wind up getting really trapped. And other people have really profound experiences, right? So if the person has the transcendental experience from the plant medicine, my most fundamental important question for them is, what are you going to do with that? Right. Is that going to change your lack? Is that going to change your, your life? If, if that insight somehow causes you to act on it, because it changes your perception of the world, and it truly causes you to be whatever it is, whatever the, the, whatever the experience is, to, to take that piece with you and use it in some way, that's great. But for many people, Insight never changes behavior. Mm. Now you can understand that your father was overbearing. You can understand that, that Saturn is in the wrong house. You know, you can, all of that stuff. You can understand that, you know, that there's a, there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. None of that. You could understand all kinds of things, but that won't really change your life. Mm. Really? It doesn't really change your life. So there are people who have done 65 ayahuasca sessions because they have cancer and the cancer hasn't changed. My advice to them is try something else. Right. Right. Just come on. Come <laughs> yeah, on. Like yeah. let's, let's just just let's make a different move here. So, mm -hmm. so my concern is is that this is human nature. Everybody has this. You know, you take a something and it makes pain go away. You take something and it gives you an altered perception of whatever. You notice that you got a change in your body. You remember what caused it, and so every time you feel that whatever, you remember to do that. Right. So now you got a dependency on something outside of you. So, on, a, a, on a substance outside yeah, of you. Yeah, so yeah. right, right. So then, so now you need that substance in order to take feeling, away, right? take away, yeah, take away the other, other feeling. That's not what this work is about. This work is about actually self-regulating and changing that feeling without anything outside mm -hmm. of you, right? Does that create mystical experiences? Profound mystical experiences in our work. Do we have the data? Yeah, we have great data to suggest that those high gamma states, the person is having a full-on sensory experience without their senses. And the brain is not having a little bit of energy. It's not having a lot of energy. It's having a supernatural amount of energy, like <laughs> more than you would ever record. Like the brain is way outside of normal, way outside of normal. Like hundreds of standard deviations outside of normal in that state. So, so it's important then for us to realize that if, if we're using that substance to, to regulate our emotional state, I would say to that person, work on changing that emotional state mm. before you take the substance and then take the substance and have a great trip. There you go, yeah. Exactly. Have, have a fun trip, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is the, uh, the biggest fear you have moving forward? Um, I really don't really have a whole lot of fears in moving forward. I feel really good about my team. I feel really good about our research. Yeah. I feel really good about the way we run events. I mean, I've always, you know, we, there's always growth pains, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we outgrow things and we have to do things different, you know, differently. Um, do you have any personal fears? No, I just want to stay healthy yeah. enough to be able to continue to do this. I'd love to get some uh, people uh, that I trust to be able to help me do some of this, you know, on the stage a little bit more. Sure, sure. Um, and I really want to make this work not about me. I right. never want it to That's be about me. Yeah, I want yeah. it to be about you, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I do really, you know, I do my best to try to be the example sure. of everything that I teach. Is your, uh, is your age out there public? I think so. <laughs> how, how, how old are you now? My body's 60 your, years your old. Bo your body's 60. Yeah. What's your mind? Oh gosh, I think I have a pretty good young mind. Yeah. <laughs> Your body's sixty. Yeah. Holy cow! I didn't even connect with that when you just said that. Yeah. That's amazing. You look incredible. Thanks, bro. I'm about. Uh, I'm in a year. I'm going to be forty. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to when you were forty, twenty years ago. Yeah. Man, you look incredible at sixty. That's amazing. Your energy. 
It's incredible. If you could go back to 40, which I'm going to be in about yeah. a year. Yeah. And you could just give me some advice. Or you yeah. could go back and give yeah. your 40-year-old self yeah, some advice. Yeah. What would you wish you knew? And what decisions do you wish you would have taken for any area of life? Whether yeah. it's flossing your yeah, teeth more no, no, or no, no. financially would, or emotions? No, it really, or... really would be to lighten up. Really? Yeah, just lighten up. Were you too tight? No, at 40, I was driven. Yeah. Right? I was driven. And it was okay because, I mean, I think you know being driven is really great. But then when I started to really want to experiment with creating from the field instead of from matter, if I decided to create something, then I went and did it. <laughs> That I didn't let the creation happen because I got in there. You were I was driven. You were I, was, driven. I, was, I was in the habit of doing it. Do, 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 right? So at 40, I, I just started to experiment with it a little bit more. And I, and I think I learned how to, I had to, I had to um, inhibit the need to kind of do it because because on some level I doubted it was going to happen, right? So at 40, I was just starting to experiment a little bit more with this. I mean, this is when I was, you know, getting interested in it. So I probably tell myself to lighten up and make it more playful. I mean, I'm really good when I'm goofy and silly and playful right? and curious. It's not really good when I'm like rigid and forcing. It's just not, it's just not me. But when people are act like childlike and they're playful and goofy and silly, what what occurs in life when they come from that state versus a driven state? I think in I think we make room for the unknown. Mm -hmm. I think I like I don't like I don't when I I mean you watch me at an events I get really I'm tired and I'm super happy like tired and happy for me is like the perfect <laughs> formula like if I'm tired and happy I see weird things I have weird experiences That's I mean cool. I get I get a lot of weird stuff so so I mean. Um, because I think my brain waves are probably in theta, like I'm wide open, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but well, I think it's so important for people to be curious. Like when I'm wondering, like I'm really mm. wondering, like what would it be like mm. to have this experience? And I really, really go down the rabbit hole with it. I love that, right? Because then, cool. and if I don't, if I come to a certain point and I don't know what happens next. I'm going to go look it up. I'm not going to get on social media and say, does anybody know anything about... I'm not going to do that. Research, I'm, going to, yeah. I'm going to own it. I'm going to own that content so that when I sit down to actually create that experience, I have enough information to believe it's possible, right? Sure, so, sure. so I think when nothing is left to conjecture, when nothing's left to superstition, when nothing's left to dogma, and people know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. The how gets so instrumental because mm. we assign meaning to it. Here's an example. You can take a person and put them in an ice bath. They know nothing about anything. They get in an ice bath. In a minute, they're going to be in hypothermia. And that ice bath is going to be really bad for them. Yes. Take that same person. Teach them a few things. Have them assign meaning to it. Make them look for the value in it. Put them back in the ice bath. Turn on the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex will silence all the circuits in the brain that say it's bad for you. And now you'll get value out of it. It's the same thing. You know, it's the same right. exact thing. Right. So, so assign meaning to the act of creation, right? Like I'm never going to stop learning wow. about that because... Those are more tools, raw, more raw materials. So I would say, people, you want to be healthy, you want to be wealthy, re study. Yeah. Get it. Get real. Get Learn. real with the process. Mm. So you want to become a mystic? Study the mystics. You know, I mean, read about yeah. them. They've done some. Listen to what they're saying, right? If you want to heal your body and your mind, then go study you and go to one of go, your events. No, no, don't, don't study me. Go, go, go watch the testimonials. Yes. Watch those people. I always say when they send me the testimonials, that's like that's food for me. Yeah. I always say. I call them up and I say, she's speaking the truth. Uh -huh. And it's not coming from me. Right. She's just telling the story. And I always say to people, don't, don't, don't ask her what meditation she did. It has nothing to do with it. It's how she changed, yes. how he changed. He's talking about change. Like this guy is stepping out of a wheelchair in Cancun with ALS, you know, or some rare, weird condition. He was in a wheelchair. He walked up to the stage, you know, at the end of the event. And, he did, and I was backstage with him. He didn't say, how come I'm not all the way healed? He said, you know, I'm just starting to figure this thing, love out. I think if I can feel deeply, my body, it's going to be good for my body. It's going to be loving to my mm -hmm. body. And I know that I can signal wow. the gene if I do it. So he's like, he's, he's in the, he's, he owns a, 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 a juice bar and he's like in the game. 
Like it's, he's assigning meaning that mm -hmm. if I can feel the emotion ahead of the experience, I'm signaling the gene ahead of the environment. I gotta get better at this feeling of love. I gotta, I gotta get more into it. I gotta assign meaning to it now. Now I'm gonna get greater value yes. from it. Right? I gotta get it, right? And then the other thing, people come to a week long event, they think, I, didn't, I don't think I'm changing. You know people who, you know those people? Yes. Uh, this doesn't that, work for me. That, 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 you know what? If you go all in, I can tell you that's not the truth. Right. So you're crossing the river, but you don't see the evidence yet. Why would you stop? It was like running a, running a marathon. You're halfway through and you're going to quit, right? Mm -hmm. You just keep, I, I can tell you there are dramatic biological changes that will happen if you go all in. Yes. That, that not, in not in just a small percentage, in almost 100% of the people. Like everybody who goes all in has profound metabolic changes. So, mm. Go all in. For the most part, the brain is a reflection of everything that we know, right? So along with that is our relationship with money. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like I have a really good relationship with money because I work on having a really good relationship with everything in my life. Right? Did you always have a good relationship with money? I think so. I think yeah. so. I've never really lived in lack. That just wasn't part of it. Even when I went to college and I had to take out student loans and stuff, I always figured out a way to always be a little bit ahead of the curve. And so... so Let's back up and just look at how people uh, form beliefs. Because yes. most beliefs um, are created from past experiences, right? So uh, children, uh, when they're uh, in their early ages, their brain waves are very slow. Like their brain waves are in alpha uh, when they're like seven to 12. They're in theta when they're like two to six years old. And, and they're in delta like when they're, when they're you know, newborn to two years old. And so these brainwave states uh, are states that were really suggestible to information. So when we hear information, we believe it. And we accept it, we believe it, we surrender to it as if it's the truth without analyzing it because there's no analytical facilities yet. Right. The, ana the analytical mind starts around 12 or so, seven to 12, and that analytical mind is actually what creates a barrier between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So, so before 12, roughly, what we see, how we model our parents' behavior, it's what all they say to us. It's all being programmed subconsciously, right? And, wow. and so, so that's really, really important because if you heard money is the root of all evil, uh, money is bad, uh, only certain people are allowed to make money. You have to work hard to make money. Mm -hmm. This is how you got to do it. And that becomes the foundation subconsciously. Like, let's like... Right, recording an audio file. You just keep recording that audio file, it becomes a subconscious program, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people have a relationship with money based on either what they've been told or what they've experienced in their outer environment, right? So, so then we gain information from our environment and the stronger the emotion we feel from experiences in our lives, the more altered we feel inside of us, the more the brain freezes a frame and takes a picture, and that snapshot is called the memory. So, Based on an emotion. Based on an emotion. The emotion alters our internal state. So you're going along as Lewis feeling really good, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have this trauma, you have this crisis, you have this shock, and all of a sudden you have this dramatic change in your internal state, and your senses get heightened, and then you freeze the frame and you associate this internal state with whatever it is that's causing it, right? And that's how we create long-term memories, right? So, are, are painful memories more uh, powerful or beautiful memories more powerful? Uh, they're both equal. Okay. They're both equal. But but the problem is I think most people experience from more the negative yes. emotions, right? And those are negative emotions really are derived from the hormones of stress, right? So the alarm system, the emergency system creates an arousal you know, inwardly. And that arousal is saying there's something dangerous in your outer environment, right? And it could be a person, a circumstance, mm -hmm. a, an accident or whatever. And that, that change in emotional state causes you to remember the event. You got to pay attention, right? You got to stay really and narrow your focus on the cause. So, so think about people who have relationships with money, right? From the past, all beliefs are based on past experiences. So you have an experience where you lose money, you have an experience where uh, money's taken away from you, you have an experience where you don't have enough, you're living in a place where there's not enough money or a family that's not enough money, then the emotion that most people are living by on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is lack. Like, I'm in lack of having something that I want, 
okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because the experience changes your emotional state. You freeze the frame, you take a picture. The problem is that's hardware. So we think neurologically within the circuits of that past experience yes. and we feel chemically within the boundaries of that emotion, which would say, for example, be lack, right? So now the person what, what says- is, Before you go on to the next thing, what happens to the body and the mind when it is in an environment of lack? Mentally or physically, I'm in lack. What is, yeah. what is the body and the mind saying? Yeah, so the body is saying, I'm waiting for some external event to occur. I win the lottery, mm -hmm. I marry the right guy, whatever right, it is, right, right. that you're waiting for that event to occur, that experience produces an emotion. So the emotion then takes away the lack. And so when we play the game in three-dimensional reality, the creation game in three-dimensional <laughs> reality, um, we experience separation from everyone or everything because our, our senses fool us into the illusion, the hallucination of separation. I'm here and you're there. Mm -hmm. I'm here and the door is over there. So I'm aware that I'm here at one point of consciousness and the door is over there, another point of consciousness. Okay, so in order for me to get from here to the door, I gotta move my body and do something through space. I gotta do something and everything in this three-dimensional reality is gonna take time and energy, yes, right? So, yes. okay, so then here's, here's Lewis right here. Mm -hmm. And then he says, okay, I want this experience in my future and your brain automatically predicts and projects how far in the future you think it's gonna take. Maybe it's a year, five years, 10 years. 30 years. Oh my gosh. Right? Because that's what it's gonna to take to pay off that house, right? So now, one point of consciousness, I'm here. The other point of consciousness is where I'm placing my dream. So I'm in separate mm. from that experience. So then how do I get to that experience? In three-dimensional reality, you gotta get up and you gotta do something. You gotta Every go to day, work, yeah. you gotta drive to work, it takes energy, you gotta fill your car with gas, you gotta eat food, you gotta work, you know, all this stuff. You gotta sleep, you gotta recover if there's stress. And now people are, in a sense, waiting for the experience that's 10 years down the road or 30 years down the road to happen to take away the lack of them not having it. And unfortunately, many times when the experience finally occurs, they can't enjoy it because mm -hmm. they're too exhausted, right? <laughs> right? So then, so you play the game, you, you, you go to school, you study really hard or you study on your own, you develop some skills, you make the right choices, you start saving money, you start learning from your mistakes, and then the game is how many things can you accumulate and that accumulation then you associate with being wealthy or being abundant or being successful, right? And some people get really good at it, right? Uh -huh. You can get really good at that. But for the most part though, when we create from three-dimensional reality, we're creating from lack and separation. In other words, you're driving down the road and you see someone driving a car that all of a sudden you realize that you don't have. The moment you become aware that that person has that car and you don't have it, you're in lack of having it, mm -hmm. right? So what the brain naturally does is it naturally creates you driving that car. And you have an image of yourself driving that car and you start identifying, wow, that would be a greater experience for me to have. The problem is the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of actually happening, it, happening for most people is the concept called time. Yeah. right between cause and effect right uh -huh. so some people develop the ability to manage themselves and manage their life they develop certain skills and they can pay for it and they can get it very quickly the problem is when the novelty of that experience wears off you know the car mm -hmm. and they're no longer identifying with that and the and the feeling of emptiness and lack comes back they need to find something else they got to go to find something else and so there's this game that goes on where you never have enough right and that's the lack game right so then if you think about people uh, having the things they want in their life, when they create from lack and separation, it's the experience in three-dimensional reality that produces the emotion. And the emotion is saying, let's feel and experience this thing that you've been in lack and separation from. And that emotion then takes away the lack or separation. But you've worked really hard to get it. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Is there another way to do it? Yes. Okay, so... The person who's living in lack is waiting for their wealth to feel abundant. 
They're waiting for their success to feel empowered. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for their healing to feel gratitude. They're waiting for their new relationship to feel love. They're waiting for the mystical experience to feel awe. That's the Newtonian model of reality of cause and effect. You know, waiting for that event to happen to take away this separation or lack. Nothing wrong with it. It's the way most people create. But what we've discovered is actually something else. The moment you feel gratitude, your healing begins. Mm. The moment you feel worthy and abundant, you're generating wealth. The moment you're empowered, you are moving towards your success. The moment you're in love with yourself and you're in love with life, you'll create an equal. The moment you are in awe of life, you're going to have a mystical experience. And so that's causing an effect, right? So then if you can teach people then how to create, instead of from lack or separation, but create from wholeness and create from what we call the quantum field, instead of three-dimensional reality. What's the difference? Okay, so the way you, first of all, it takes knowledge, okay? The quantum field is an invisible field of energy that exists beyond our senses. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't hear it, you can't feel it. It exists beyond our experience of three-dimensional reality. Would this be in the, our mind's consciousness or would this be in a different space? Okay, let's, let's, let's look at that. So. The answer to the question is, how much of your waking day do you put your attention on matter, mm -hmm. on the material world, and how much of your waking day are you aware of energy and frequency? For most people, they're unaware of the quantum field. And if you're unaware of it, it doesn't exist for you. Right. Just like you have a nose, but if you're unaware of it, it doesn't exist for you. The moment mm -hmm. you become aware of it, it exists. Well, the quantum field, you can ask, you could study all kinds of science and they'll tell you there is this invisible field of frequency and energy that exists beyond the senses that tend to connect everything physical and material. In fact, everything physical and material is connected to this field. Okay, so how do you get there, right? How do you get there? How do you get there? How do you get there? <laughs> so we discovered that when you take all of your attention off your body and you are not paying attention to your emotions, your drives, your habits. If you could take all of your attention off of every element in your environment, your cell phone, your tablet, your computer, uh, your, your car, your whatever it is, your bed, take, away, take your attention away from everything, every place that you live, where you sleep, or you work, and you're not thinking about time. You're not thinking about your schedule, where you need to be, or what happened yesterday. You can relax into the present moment. There, there tends to be a dramatic change in the way the brain functions when people do this properly. We call it getting beyond yourself, but in a sense, you're dissociating from your three-dimensional mm -hmm. reality. Why? Because if you're thinking about anything in your three-dimensional reality, that's where your attention is and that's where your energy is, okay? so. We kind of figured out this formula when people really become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time. We are pretty much all of a sudden outside the constraints of the Newtonian world of got to do something to get an outcome. And if you can teach people how to linger there without a name, without a face, without a profession, without a family, without a culture, without a past, without a disease, you teach them how to be in this place we call the unknown, right? And you teach them that from that place, that invisible field, is where everything material comes from. And if they could create coherence in their brain, you need a strong signal in the brain. The more coherent the brain, the more stronger the signal. What do you mean a strong signal? Okay, let's see how I could say this. <laughs> when most people, we look at, when we look at brains in real time and we're looking at people's, how their, how their mind is working, when you're under stress, okay, stress is created by not being able to predict something that's mm -hmm. gonna happen in your life, uh, the perception that something's gonna get worse or you can't control something, right? So when that occurs, we switch on that primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system and the brain goes into this very alarm state called high beta. That means pay attention to the outer world, there's danger out there. So it's, but if it's not a predator and it's traffic or your coworker or your ex, right. This is where it gets to be a problem because <laughs> it becomes very maladaptive, right? Uh -huh. So when we're in that state and the brain is that, in that aroused state, 
we try to control and predict everything. So every person, every object, every thing, every place, uh, every even your body has a neurological network in your brain, right? So as the arousal happens, we start shifting our attention to all these elements. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain starts firing very, very incoherently. And when the brain's incoherent, we're incoherent. It's so just that's not, not a strong signal. That's not, there's, it's a static on the wire. That's disconnection. There is mm -hmm. no signal. Right. So when we're in that state, we're always really looking for the worst case scenario of what's going to happen. Because mm -hmm. if you prepare for the worst, anything less happens, a better chance of survival, right? So, so in this kind of aroused state, as we shift our attention to each one of these elements that are known in our environment, the brain starts compartmentalizing and firing out of order. And, and, and that is what creates what's called autonomic dysregulation. That causes the brain and body to get really out of balance, right? So in that state, we're, we're over-focused. You know, when you're stressed, you're over-focused on something. You can't stop thinking about it. Our research shows that when you do that, you actually make your brain worse. Mm. Because you're analyzing your problems within some disturbing emotion, and that emotion is driving you further out of balance. You're actually knocking your brain and body out of balance by thought alone, and you're driving it into these more aroused states, right? For someone that's been living like that for decades, that's their base mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. how do they even realize how to get out of that. They don't. Usually it takes crisis, right? It takes right. trauma. Extreme breakdown. Yeah, breakdown. It a loss, a death, yeah, a, all of a that. breakup, a divorce, a near... You Bankruptcy, know, whatever. Yeah. whatever it is. A disease, a diagnosis, whatever. Something where you just can't go on business as usual. Now it's time to really start looking. They, right? they have to wake up. Then. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's get back to the concept of yes. abundance here because... You need a strong signal in this field. Right. So then... If you can teach people to do the exact opposite, go from putting all of their attention on everything physical and material in the world of separation, and instead of narrowing their focus on something material, ask them to broaden their focus and put it on nothing. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but when you put your attention on space and you divert your attention, the act of sensing without thinking actually starts to slow the brain waves down. Mm -hmm. Not only slow it down, but all of a sudden cause the brain to start re reintegrating, starts to synchronize, right? And so you see different compartments of the brain that were firing out of order start to mm -hmm. resonate. They start to communicate. They're, 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 they're all of a sudden synchronizing. And what syncs in the brain kind of links in the brain. Mm -hmm. So when a person has their whole entire brain firing in rhythm, that's a very strong signal that you can send out into the field. If so when you, that signal is strong in that position, what can you create from that space? Okay, so, but that's only one element. Okay. So then the clear intention tends to be a very important element that we have to have to get down. And the more coherent the brain, the more clear the signal for that intention. So with intention and attention, we could actually make thought more real than anything else. Now, what is that? Mm. You're saying, what would it be like to be wealthy? What would it be like to be abundant? What would it be like to have all my needs met? What would it be like to have more than I need? Mm -hmm. What would I do if I had everything I ever wanted? The answer always is the same. You start giving stuff away. Because if an abundant person is truly right. abundant, why would they hold on? They would say, There's, I'm not in lack. There's more for everybody, okay? Turns out, though, that the signal sent out isn't enough. You've got to have to draw the experience back to you. And so send the signal out to, you know... It's coherent brain. Financial freedom, whatever abundance, that is. all these different right, things. Right, right, right. Whatever that is for you. Whatever so that is for you. Putting that out there with right. your signal, with the intention and the attention. Right. And then how do you draw okay, it so, to so you? Now, so, so in the physical world... Right. The in the physical world, world you've got to go get it. You've got to do something. This is the plane of demonstration. You've got to go get it. And when you, you're in lack until it occurs, right? Mm -hmm. But, so, but I'm hearing you say there's a way to not chase but attract. All right, so if you're creating from the field instead of from matter, right, there's a very strong possibility that you'll shorten the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of having it. And when there's a vibrational match between your energy and that future that you want to experience, now if you're creating from the field, you actually don't go anywhere to get it. Mm. You actually draw it to you. Mm. So the, here comes the synchronicities, <laughs> the serendipities, the coincidences, yes. the opportunities, and they come out of nowhere. And you, you say, I don't understand. I, I, I didn't do anything. Well, you changed your energy. And, and so then 
the, the other element is a coherent heart, right? Mm -hmm. And the heart has a magnetic signature. And the magnetic signature is what draws reality to us, right? So you combine that clear intention with a coherent brain. Now here's the key. This takes practice. Yes. Because the person who's living in lack is usually unworthy, is usually insecure, is usually in their past, they're usually frustrated, they're usually impatient, they're usually resentful because nothing's changing out there because it's taking too long. Well, that's mm. everything takes a lot of time when you do matter to matter, right? So then if you teach them, okay, we know all about that. We know the story behind yeah, that. We know what your, your parents past, told yeah. you about money, all that other, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But now let's do something that would be really cool. Let's, let's write down the feelings of how you would feel if that future happened and you're going to have to feel that feeling before it occurs. So now, okay, what does a, an abundant person feel? Pretty much free, a lot of free, freedom. Peace, peace, excited, joyful. Uh, uh, um, in love with life, mm -hmm. grateful to be alive, abundant. Okay, now, Let's practice mm -hmm. feeling those. Turns out when you're feeling those other emotions like resentment and impatience and frustration, you're stepping on the gas pedal, you're just turning on the sympathetic nervous system, and you're stepping on the brake. At which the same is, time. At the same time, which is oh. you're angry, you're frustrated, but the fight or flight nervous system says run, fight, or hide, and you're sitting in a Zoom meeting and you're neck is pulsating is because the heart is beating against the closed system, right? You're not, you're not using it in an adaptive way. So mm. the heart starts firing out of order. It starts firing incoherently and incoherent waves cancel each other out. It's called destructive interference and then we stop trusting our future. Energy leaves the heart. Energy leaves the brain, energy leaves the heart. You can't get in touch with the feeling of your future because in survival, which those are hormones of stress, all those emotions. In survival, it's not a time to create, right? It's time to run, fight, and hide. Okay, so we gotta lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want. The habit of doing it that way for something greater to occur, okay. And what happens if we create, try to create from survival emotions? It just takes a long time. You just, you, you'll just force it. Little, yeah. spin, little steps at a time. You'll force world. it, yeah. you'll, you'll force it, you'll fight for it, you'll compete for it, and you'll manipulate, you'll cheat, you'll lie. Uh, you'll do anything to get what you want because that's what matter does when it's trying to change matter. And everybody's, everybody's playing that game, right? Everybody's trying to c accumulate the most amount of things. Mm, right. Okay, so that's what abundance means to certain people. Get as many things as you can. Okay. You want that? Not a problem. But let's learn the formula of how to create, right? Yes. So then, So then you'd have to feel those emotions before the experience occurred. And if you understood that you could dissociate all of your attention from this three-dimensional reality and have no attention on anything known and understand it's the field that creates matter, mm. not matter that emits the field. And if you could get to that place and change your energy with a clear intention and elevated emotion, your heart starts beating in this beautiful rhythm like a drum. We've measured it so many times. And when that occurs, the next thing that happens, the heart informs the brain it's safe to create now. So the person Gosh. relaxes into the present moment. And then we see this, like if you took a big sheet, you know, and a blanket and you went like that, the energy of the heart actually informs the brain to move into these beautiful, elegant states of alpha brainwave patterns, mm. coherent alpha. And that's saying, what's the next dream? What is it the next, what's the next opportunity you want to experience? That's a state of creation. So now you have a Wi-Fi signal. You got a coherent brain, that's a directive, that's a signal out. And you got this coherent heart. That's what draws it to us, right? You combine those two, and if there's a vibrational match between your energy and that potential in the quantum field, and you're feeling abundant, and whatever your brain associates with being abundant, that's your call. That's what the creative process is. This is the creative center. The brain, the frontal lobe actually says, what would it be like to be creative or, or abundant? I don't know what it'd be like to be abundant. Well, then go read a few books on people <laughs> who, who actually became abundant and realized it wasn't a glorious process. Mm. They failed miserably. They, let, they got betrayed. They learned a lot of lessons, but they persevered. Mm -hmm. And what are the qualities 
of that person that you could embody. That, that's the key, right? Because it's, it's not about wealth. It's who you become, mm-hmm. right? Because people think it's about their wealth, but it's the becoming process. It's the overcoming. That attracted that, right? Of course. So then, so then you got to turn the battleship around because most people say, I can't feel grateful for my wealth because it hasn't happened yet. That's the hypnosis waiting for the experience to happen to feel grateful. Well, that's Newtonian, that's three-dimensional reality, that's cause and effect. The quantum, you gotta feel it in order for you to experience it, okay? So this heart becomes like an amplifier and it sends that signal out and that frequency can carry the thought of your abundance. Can't, suffering cannot carry the thought of your abundance. Lack cannot carry the thought of your abundance. It's, it's a different frequency, right? We feel different feelings like suffering. We think different thoughts, right? So, so people can say, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, all they want, but that thought is never making it to the body because it's stopping at the brainstem because the body's saying, I'm miserable, I'm unhappy, mm-hmm. I'm in lack, right? So, so the affirmation doesn't work, right? Okay, so let's go one step further. Yes. So if you practice this, and you actually understood, you know, well, well, we teach this pretty well, but if you, you, if you learned it just like learning how to play handball or mm-hmm. learning how to hit a golf ball, learning how to dance a salsa, if you just practice the form, you got really good at it. If you were doing it properly then, what would be the outcome? The experiment of being abundant would be that you would have to feel that feeling. It's so good at doing it with your eyes closed. Mm-hmm. You gotta do it with your eyes open. Now, why? <laughs> because if you're feeling the feelings of your emotions, of your future, you're no longer looking for them. Because you you're in the future now. Your, your body is so objective that it's believing it's living in that reality yes. where you are abundant. And as long as you feel that emotion, you're not separate from it any longer. You're no longer in lack. You're no longer looking for it to occur. occur. Say, why hasn't it happened yet? If you're feeling abundant, why would you look? Right? You, you, would, you right. wouldn't. So, so, so then... Our job then is to be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body. So, okay, so does that mean like you should check your bank account tomorrow and see if there's a half a million dollars in it? No. You keep tuning into that potential and then here come the synchronicities. Yes. What's that? That's feedback in your environment. It's the universe saying, hey, Lewis, whatever you're doing, all of a sudden <laughs> we are starting to create, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's so important for people to remember that they're the creators of their lives instead of the victim of their lives, mm-hmm. right? So the victim is saying, I'm feeling this way because that person or that circumstance or I don't have any money is causing me to feel this way. That's my relationship with money. What that really means is I'm using my lack to reaffirm my dependency, my addiction, my conditioning. That's my relationship with money is that I put my attention on money because I don't have it. Mm. So the relationship with money is of course built on lack. And so when they don't have it, they feel bad. And what they're really saying is my outer environment, my reality is actually controlling the way I feel and the way I think. So Lewis, why are you in a good mood today? Things are going good. Why in a bad mood? Things are going bad today. So. This unconscious program of victimization is saying that, that, that we're, we're allowing our environment to influence the way we feel and the way we think. Isn't that, isn't that what victimization is? And, and the stronger the emotion we have to our lack, the more we put our attention on the fact that we don't have it, right? Yeah. So then the person has forgotten that they're creating reality because what they're creating is lack. And they're creating more of it. And then they try harder and they force harder and they control more. And they're more, more exhausted and, and their more, body's tired. And, and they're, they're breaking mind. down. And, right. So, so the experiment then is let's try it another way. Let's create from the field instead of from matter. Get a coherent heart. Get a coherent brain. Relax in the heart and energy moves right into the brain. We've measured this a thousand times. And all of a sudden the person moves into these beautiful, elegant brainwave states where they're super creative, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the longer you're conscious of that energy the more you draw that future to you. So then what does the synchronicity mean? It means whatever you're doing inside of you is producing that effect outside of you. Pay attention to what you did and do it again. So generate a little bit more abundance. Just Uh do it for an experiment. Now, when the synchronicity happens, do you think you feel suffering or do you think you feel a little excitement? You feel inspired, right? Mm -hmm. So then that synchronicity is saying, use this energy, use this feeling. It should be easier for you to feel this now and go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. Keep the experiment going. And here comes the promotion. Here comes the here comes the email. Here mm-hmm. comes the person you meet at the right time. Yes. Right? Whoa! We have something happening here, and then that that becomes the momentum, right? So then, 
we generate abundance. That's that's how we do it. And the relationship it doesn't just happen by accident. We generate it. We generate abundance, right? So then, if you have an hour meditation where you're tuning into your abundant future, but then you're spending the other fifteen hours a day in lack, don't expect anything to change. You defaulted. Mm -hmm. You're back to the old energy. And if you say it's that person or that circumstance or that bank account, I'm going to say you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim, right? Mm -hmm. So then, so then. So then let's go a step further. If your personality creates your personal reality, and it does, and your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel, then the present personality who's listening to this podcast has created the present personal reality called their life. Nothing big there. Which means if you want to change your personal reality, you're going to have to change your personality. Right. Nothing changes in your life until you change, right? Mm -hmm. So then, 95% of who we are is, is on autopilot, right? It's, it's a programmed thoughts, hardwired thoughts, beliefs, perceptions, unconscious habits and behaviors, and really, really emotional responses that tend to be really knee-jerk and automatic, right? So if 95% of who we are is a set of unconscious programs, then the first step to change is becoming conscious of those unconscious thoughts. Now, people think when they sit down to do the work and make their change that they're, they're doing something wrong. No, those thoughts have to come up. I can, I'm not worthy, it's never gonna work. But the person who's truly persevering towards their abundance realizes just because they have that thought doesn't mean it's true. They're curious on what's on the other side of that thought. Ah, well, that's just the thought, right? Mm -hmm. And nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. So you keep moving past that thought, it, gets, it has less and less power over you, right? Uh, now, you're, you have power over it, or, or better, better yet, you're using your brain in the proper way instead of your, being a victim to your brain, sure. right? If you complain about money, if you judge people who have it, if you rush when you're in lack, if you cheat when you don't have what you need, an abundant person doesn't do that. You gotta look at that and say, I gotta break these habits. Yes. Oh my God, if I truly wanna be abundant, I can't act this way. Now here's the big one. <laughs> if, if I truly wanna be a new personality that's in a new personal reality, I can't take lack with me. I can't take unworthiness. I can't take the story that goes along with it with my parents or my grandparents mm -hmm. or, or my ex or whatever. That story has to end, right? I mean, if not now, when, right? How do people end those stories? Well, of course. Well, how many times do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? Right. That's the game, right? Mm -hmm. That's the game called change. How many times do we have to go unconscious and default to that old personality when we catch ourselves and stop doing that and get conscious? That's the moment of change. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that most people wake up in the morning and they think, uh, let me think of my problems, right? The, the brain is a record of the past, right? So they think about their problems. They don't have enough money. And those, those problems are usually connected to certain people at certain places mm -hmm. with certain objects and certain things. What didn't work time. out or who right. screwed me so, over. Or so what, yeah. the moment they wake up, the moment they remember those problems, they're thinking in the past. Mm. So now they're firing and wiring the memory. They're keeping the memory of the past alive in their mind. The problem is... Every one of those memories has an emotion associated with it because we've experienced it. So when they feel the lack, when they feel the unhappiness, when they feel the anxiety, now the body's in the past. Thoughts being the language of the brain, feelings being the language of the body, how we think and how we feel creates our state of being. But the conditioning process starts because conditioning only needs a thought and a feeling, a memory or an image and an emotion and a stimulus and a response and you're conditioning your body to become mm. the mind of that emotion. And now the, the memory's not in the brain. Now the memory's buried subconsciously in the body. And the body becomes the mind of that emotion. So the body is living in lack. And it's believing. It's the body living. is. Is the, that through the nervous system or is that through, through neurochemical the cells, everything? It's everything. So the, so, so the body's so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating the lack and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone called lack. Mm. The body's believing it's living the same past experience every day. It's, it, it, why? Because the end product of an experience is an emotion. 
Mm -hmm. oh, well, if you if your life is changing, but you're still feeling lack, don't expect anything to change. You, you won't even see it. You'll walk right past it. You're viewing your life through the lens of the past. Okay. So, okay. So then a person realizes that all their friends are making money and they're doing stuff and they're like, wow, I'm really feeling lack now. So then when it no longer <laughs> becomes about your abundance, and it becomes about your change, that's a valuable moment. When it's mm. no longer about your healing, but it's about your change. I paid attention to a lot of people in, in the last couple of years to tell their story. The people who heal in this work from cancers and all kinds of chronic health conditions and Parkinson's and strokes and paralysis and all kinds of things, it's rare genetic disorders. It, it never was about, when they've really got in the game, it was never about their healing. It was about what do I need to change in order to heal? When the game goes like that, so then the person who's feeling lack, on some level or another, it's not just in the mind, it's in the body. How do I create you know, the person uh, of my dreams that I want uh, in my life? And I always say, take out a piece of paper, uh -huh. write down everything you want in that person, and then become it. That's it. Because um, so many people have so many interesting definitions about what they think love is, right? And so uh, some people have it in terms of need. Some people have it in terms of sexuality. Some people have it in terms of control and, and dominance and success. And so those are different experiences that really don't lead to this concept called love. And so my theory in a relationship, um, uh, I was I was in Australia for three weeks, and I was doing this big book tour, and I was on all these television shows and all these radio shows, and you know I wanted to talk about you know the science of changing your mind, you know the neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and every television show they were asking me about soulmates, how do you create? <laughs> and I, and I was just so tired by the by the end of this tour. I was at the Establishment Hotel in, in Sydney, and I was sitting with a CNN reporter, an attractive woman, and she said, how, do, how come I can't create the relationship that I want? And I just was so over it. I just looked at her and I said, let me ask you a question. Would you go out with you? Mm. Which is really the fundamental question. So I have a couple of theories about relationships that I think are really important, and I, I use the same exact principles with my life. Uh, first of all, I will never work in a relationship, and I don't think anybody should work in a relationship. I think if you're working in a relationship, something is not clicking, something is not right. But if you bring your best, and the person that you're with brings their best, and you celebrate your life together, then there's, there's constructive interference, there's growth, there's energy. If you're not at your best and you show up, more than likely you're gonna pick someone or something apart, and it's better that you remove yourself for a period of time and get back into your heart mm. and present yourself at your best. And so if you're not there and you need a mirror or a reflection, then it's good to ask, am I missing something? Am I not seeing myself in some way? And then there's a healthy conversation when you invite it. But if you're not invited to contribute your opinion, <laughs> then it's better off that you don't, right? Mm. So people always say, I want a loving relationship, but what they really want is happiness, really. So we, we do these meditations uh, to create love in our lives. And, and it could be love in uh, familiar relationships with your siblings, it could be with your parents, it could be with your friends, or it could be with a significant other. And so if thoughts are the electrical charge in the quantum field, and feelings are the magnetic charge in the quantum field, and how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. Mm. The thought sends a signal out, and the feeling is the magnetic field that draws the event back to you. Right. So if you're not in a place where you're in love with life, or in love with yourself, or practicing 
diminishing your emotional reactions to certain people or conditions in your life and you're living in anger or hostility or judgment or fear and you want a loving relationship, there is no magnetic field for you to draw that to you. Hmm. And in fact, if you say to me, well, it's that person or that circumstance that's caused me to feel this way, then I would say, I mean, that person or that circumstance is controlling the way you feel and the way you think. And anything that controls the way we feel and the way we think, we are victims to, right? So most people are unconsciously responding to the conditions in their environment, experiencing emotions that are derived from the hormones of stress. Those emotions cause us to feel separate from our dreams. They heighten our senses, mm. so if we can't see them, it doesn't exist. The threat or the danger puts us in emergency mode. And we can think positively about the relationship we want. We could send the signal out into the field. We could have pictures. We could, have, we could remind ourselves of what it is. But if you're not drawing the experience back to you because your response to the environment is actually weakening your organism, it's mm. weakening your response, is actually weakening the body, then you will be, as a victim, more vulnerable to the conditions in your environment, whether large or small. And I'm talking about microorganisms as well. So if you wanted a true relationship where it was fundamentally based on this concept called love. Now let's talk about that because we practice this a lot in the work that we do. If you could truly begin to practice trading those survival emotions mm -hmm. every day for elevated emotions and you practiced opening your heart, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that has to take place where you move out of survival. Mm. So people say to me, well, I can't open my heart. I, I, don't, I can't feel love. And I say, well, what do you practice feeling? Because whatever you practice feeling, you're feeling most of the time. And that feeling could be guilt, but you're so used to it, you wouldn't even know it's guilt. It just feels like you. Are most people practicing a feeling or are they just reacting to how they feel? Well, they're, they're, they're reacting to their external environment. What's or, happening? Or, or they're reacting to some stray thought in their mind and every thought produces a chemical. So if they have an unhappy thought, they feel unhappy. If they have a judgmental thought, it produces chemicals that makes you feel polarized, right? So how much does one thought change your chemical body? Oh, that's an interesting question. So let's just, let, let, <laughs> we'll put this on hold okay, here. Yes. So, so the stronger the emotions that we feel from the problems and conditions in our life, the more altered we feel inside of us, the more we pay attention to what's causing it outside of us. Mm. So if you have an event in your life, an experience in your life that has a strong emotional charge to it, and you don't feel like your normal self, you feel this alarm system switch on you're gonna narrow your focus on the cause and the brain's gonna take a snapshot and that's called a long-term memory, right? Mm. So then what people don't know is that every time they think about that event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event was occurring. And in the, that moment. In that moment. So the highly charged event is actually producing the emotion and the body is so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the real experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that the person is fabricating by thought alone. The body's believing. It's so objective, it's believing it's in the same environmental experience. So the strong, the highly charged emotional events, you, you, some people think of their ex and the uh -huh. thought of that person makes them sick, makes them feel out of balance. Wow. So, and I, one image, one thought in their mind makes them feel out of balance. So all you need is an image and an emotion, a thought and a feeling, a stimulus and a response, and you're conditioning your body emotionally into the past. Mm. So now, the memories, and this is just not in the brain now, it's in the body, okay? So now, that thought of that person is actually creating a response in the body that's consuming the body's energy for growth and repair, consuming the body's energy to create, because in survival, it's not a time to create. In survival, it's time to run, fight, and hide. So the problem is, is that it becomes a subconscious program. It's no longer a conscious process. It now is a subconscious process. So now the body has been conditioned into resentment, into unhappiness, 
into fear, anxiety, whatever it is. And so as you back to our concept of bringing love into your life. So you say to that person, okay, you open your heart and they're gonna say, are you kidding me? I was injured, yeah. I was hurt. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, let me see your cards first, right? <laughs> right. And once I see your cards, then I'll, pra- then I'll open up a little bit. So, so we protect this, right? So now in, in that state of survival, the, the, the research shows that the long-term effects of those stress hormones are pushing the genetic buttons that are creating disease. The body can't live in emergency mode for mm. that period of time. So in a sense, the person is making themselves sick by thought alone. Their thoughts are making them sick, literally. So the problem is, is now the body is conditioned into the past and it's the mind. Now once the the body body is the mind, the body becomes the mind emotionally. So now all of this energy is stored in the body and now the person now has to leave their unhappiness and step out into the unknown. They have to get out of the familiar feelings that has, has defined them. So they'll say, I can't really feel joy. I can't really feel love. And what they're really saying is, I've, I've been conditioning my body emotionally so much into the past that I can't feel anything else other than what I know. Anger, resentment, pain, yeah. suffering. And psychology calls those normal human states of consciousness. Those are altered states of consciousness. So normal states of consciousness are these kind of negative feelings? No, I'm saying that those states of survival, people say anger, fear, those are normal things. No, those are, those are in survival. Those are altered states. You're the survival chemicals are actually knocking your brain and body out of balance. You're out of balance in that moment. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing that, the imbalance is now the new balance. And now you're altered emotionally. So back to the concept of love. Mm So the person can theoretically, intellectually, philosophically say, oh, I want this type of person. She's got to be this way. He's got to look this way. He's got to be like this. And they're basically saying, I want something that represents all the things that I no longer want. Right. (laughs) And so they're creating with their brain and mind, which is perfect. The problem is, is that if you can't feel the emotion of your future, your manifestation of love before it's made manifest. Like people say, well, well, when my relationship happens, when I find Mr. Right, then I'm gonna feel love. Like waiting for the outer environment to change, to take away this feeling of anger, resentment, emptiness, but they forgot that they create reality. In other words, when it finally appears that I'm gonna feel love, that's, that's cause and effect. We're waiting for something to happen. If you're feeling the lack and the emptiness, then you're keeping your relationship at arm's length because mm. you don't have the magnetic field to draw to you. So the emotions that come from these energy centers, the lower energy centers in our body do have frequencies, there's chemistry involved, but they have a different agenda. So now we mm. ask the person, can you teach your body emotionally? what the future will feel like before it's made manifest. That means you can't wait for your relationship to feel love. You have to reverse that battleship and understand feeling love is going to be the magnet. And if you can hold the vision of your future, a clear intention with a coherent brain, organize signals into the field, and you could actually crack this thing open and practice getting so present in the moment Hmm. that you're not anticipating the next moment or trying to predict the future, and you're no longer romancing the emotions of your past, you can find that sweet spot of the generous present moment. The familiar past is the known emotionally. The predictable future is the habituation of autopilot being unconscious and programs. Those are both knowns. Hmm. There's only one place where the unknown exists. That's the present moment. So if you could work with your body to the point that it trusts you enough to feel so safe hmm. that you have conquered it in a certain way that it could actually relax into the present moment. And it's not worried about what's gonna happen next or what's going on around, around you or that you need to eat, you need to pee, you need to move. Right. You, you got beyond all your drives and you're, you're ready to create. That moment where you're present, if you could begin to work with your heart 
and start to breathe and start to practice feeling love. In the beginning, it would feel foolish or gratitude. Why would I feel love if it hasn't happened? Well, that's because you've been hypnotized mm. into waiting for your world to change to feel, feel the emotion from the experience. Wow. But according to the quantum model, your emotion ahead of the experience, when you combine that clear intention with the elevated emotion and you feel love, your body's so objective that it's actually believing, it's living in that future mm. in the present moment. And your body now is beginning to change. You are beginning to change your biology to reflect what you're about to experience in your future. So the stronger the love you feel, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you're gonna pay attention to that picture in your mind. Stimulus, response, memory, emotion, mm. thought and feeling, but now, you're remembering your future instead of remembering your past. And biologically, wow. it's actually wow. the same. How do we, how, remembering your future as opposed to remembering your past? Right, it's the same thing biologically. The so, body experiences the same way by thinking and imagining something that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Okay, well. And imagining something vividly from the past that happened. Sometimes our brains trick ourselves in thinking it happened a different way, doesn't it? Yeah, but that's, that's incidental. It's none yeah, of your business yeah. how it happened. In fact, it's in how fact, I interpret it. Exactly. It's your perception, right? So, huh. so then the, the stronger the emotion you feel from some outer experience in your life, the more altered you feel, the more the brain freezes the frame and takes a snapshot. Well, now you're freezing a frame in the outer environment. But if you're truly in the present moment and you know exactly what you want, and you begin to teach your body emotion, start practicing opening that heart, it's amazing what happens. The moment that heart begins to open, We've measured this so many times, Lewis, on a, on a scan, on a, on a real-time brain scan. When the heart moves into this kind of rhythm, when you're feeling frustration, when you're feeling impatient, when you're feeling resentment, you are stepping on the gas pedal and you're stepping on the brake at the same time oh. and the heart is pumping against a closed system and it causes an erratic beat. It, it becomes incoherent. And energy literally leaves the heart. Now, you no longer believe in your future. You can't put your heart into your future. You can't trust the outcome because there's no energy there. It's, it's being used and consumed somewhere else. So energy is leaving the brain as well. But once energy starts to move into the heart, we've seen this so many times, and it starts to beat in this rhythm like banging a drum or dropping a pebble in water, pebble after pebble, the heart begins to create a wave of energy right to the brain. Like, like taking a big sheet and going like that, and then all of a sudden you see this wave, wow. and the brain gets this rush of energy, and that change in brain wave patterns, that change, that wave is carrying information and the person starts to get a very clear idea. They see their future very clearly. Now, now that energy is causing them to move into very coherent alpha brainwave patterns, which is the state of creation. This is when you no longer hear the voice in your head that's talking to you, that you listen to and believe is the truth. I'm not good enough. Yeah, whatever that is. Those are, that's called the default mode. It suppresses the default mode network, and the next thing you know, you start seeing in pictures and images, you start dreaming. And that's the imagination, that's the creative state. So now, you start naturally imagining the heart is the creative center. We gotta put our heart into our future, it better be open and activated. Mm. So now, when you start falling in love with your future, oxytocin is released in the brain and in the heart. Oxytocin signals nitric oxide. Nitric oxide signals another chemical called endothelial derived relaxing factor. And just like when your sexual organs get filled with blood because you're aroused, the same thing happens here as it would happen somewhere else. And literally the arteries in the heart and lungs engorge and now your heart feels full and it's thumping in order and you're in the present moment. Now once that happens, and it's beating in rhythm, the heart produces an external magnetic field up to three meters wide. Now, you're in survival, you're drawing from the field and turning into chemistry. When you get energy in the heart, it's causing a change in the brain, and all of a sudden it's resetting the baseline for trauma, and now here you have a magnetic field. Now the heart is your magnet. It is, it is the center of creation. And now that, that energy is frequency. Mm and frequency carries information. And you can lay the thought of your new relationship on that energy because it's consistent with it. You cannot lay the, 
thought of your new relationship in need. That's a different energy. What do you and, mean in need? Well, if you're feeling I'm needing I'm someone needy, to love me, yeah, of course. Partner. That's a different frequency. That's a different energy. What happens when you're in a need state as opposed to an attraction state? Well, you're in lack. So mm. now you're trying, you're grasping, you're controlling, you're forcing, you're trying to predict, you're overthinking, overanalyzing, and that's how people live their relationships. So then if you are going to prepare your brain and body for a new relationship, then you would have to become love completely mm. every day. And that signal then that you're sending out into the field can carry the thought of your health, your wealth, your relationship or whatever. But here's the cool part. When the heart is activated like that, and you feel so whole, so in love with life, so satisfied in the moment, so exuberant, that it's impossible to want. Now you're no longer in lack. <laughs> now you're so whole that you will magnetize wholeness in your life. Uh. The person who's the person that fits the mold energetically, that would be the same as you and yet complement you, so that the two can become one, mm -hmm. right? And then, instead of in contrast, in union, you exchange information mm. equal to that emotional state. In other words, people use each other to reaffirm their, their dependence on certain emotions. You have certain people you complain with about politics or whatever, they complain back about their lives and you use each other to reaffirm you know, some type of uh, belief or something. Belief right, or, yeah. about life emotionally, you have emotional agreements on things. Well, that, that emotion is energy, and energy is frequency, and frequency carries information. So you share the same energy, you share the same information, but that's what people do in their lives. But now, in a true loving relationship, when you're truly in your heart, then the question is, what would love do in the relationship? And when your heart is open, it's no longer about you. Yeah. It's about how I feel so amazing with you. I feel even more amazing, but without you, I'm still whole. Mm. And so now I'm no longer in need or lack. And so now when we get together and our fields interfere, when they start interfering, now the amplitude gets way higher and there's way more energy. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm all about all seven centers of the body lining up, all of them. And we're here in a body, let's enjoy it all, but right. come from love. And so now your heart is so open that you can't do anything else but give. You feel so amazing. You're so happy with yourself, so happy with your life, so happy with what you have. You want other people to feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And you say, here, take that. And when you give now, guess what happens? you release more oxytocin, more nitric oxide, and more of those chemicals that cause the heart to swell even more. Then all of a sudden your immune system gets stronger, and all of a sudden your body starts feeling better, you start having more energy, mm. and now it, the constructive interference between two people that are coming together in wholeness, and no longer dependence, mm. or lack, or separation, or need, is a different game. So then, what they do to protect to nurture, to grow, to evolve that love is one of the most important things that they have. Not because they're doing it out of obligation or because they're married or whatever. It's just they can't not do it. And we see people, we were, had somebody stand the other day in our workshop in profoundly high amounts of gamma. She can do it on command. And there's a, an incredible arousal that takes place that goes along with these high brain frequencies that you can only ex describe as ecstasy or bliss. Now you're getting that ecstasy and bliss not from anyone or anything out there. No drug, no person, no, no football game, no shopping spree mm. is doing that. It's somehow, Inside. it's coming from within. Like, what is that connection that you have? And so one of the scientists said to this woman, how do you do that? You know what she said? I have difficulty not doing it. I can't not do it when I'm in a it's too when I'm when I'm doing this, I it's too good. So now that could be a constant feeling in your life. So now what love? Independent of anyone or anything, it's coming from within you. Mm. Okay? So think about this. Whether you're in a relationship or single, it doesn't matter, you're whole. 
your love is not wavering, it's constant, right? So now imagine having this feeling. And when oxytocin is released, what most people don't know is that it seeps into the amygdala and there's certain survival emotions in the amygdala, fear and anxiety, aggression and anger, pain and suffering. And it literally mm. shuts the lights out in those circuits in the amygdala. And there's only <laughs> one thing left, love and joy, right? Huh. So now this person is suppressing the survival centers, resetting the baseline of the past, how they perceive the past. And now the research on oxytocin shows that when you have just a slight, slight level of increase, and ours, our, our research shows our students are way outside of normal, yeah that it's impossible to hold a grudge. You know why? Because the feeling feels so good, why would you judge another person or why would you react to some condition and lose that feeling? You figure it out really fast. So this birth of unconditional love really says, I'm in love with myself, my connection to some divine intelligence within me, and because mm. I'm so in love with life and with myself, I'm looking at life through the lens of love, which means I'm gonna allow you to be whoever you want around me. I don't really, you, you I'm no longer. I'm not a reaction. I'm not a reaction me. because I've overcome my fear. I've overcome my anger and now I'm ready for love. And now that relationship that you have, if you find that equal, mm. huh, that's a needle in the haystack because now it's a vibrational match. Right. And so as long as you're evolving, as long as I'm evolving, as long as we're sharing the same ideals, mm -hmm. as long as we're working together, as long as we have our independence, and as long as we come together and we bring our best, and I say to you, how was your day? I mean, what did you learn? Or let's start our day. So how are you gonna be today? Come on, let's just support each other. So what are the programs you're gonna stay away from? Are you gonna rush? You know, what did you do yesterday that you wanna to improve today? Mm. How can I support you? How can I love you in that? You wanna text at noon, what do you need? And then. How am I gonna be? Okay, tell me how you vocalize it, articulate it, so that now I understand your intention and I can support, that's good. And so then, when the person can articulate it, what are they doing? They're, cre they're rehearsing in their mind who mm. they're gonna be, and so now they're becoming conscious of that future. And then they have to work on staying, un staying conscious of their unconscious programs, and by articulating that, they're gonna let, not let those thoughts slip by as well. So then, now you have two people in evolution. It's no longer about all the other things. It's not about the money. It's not about the sex. It's not about the weight. It's not about the diet. Those are all things that are we already know. This is something else. This is a whole nother level where when you exchange and evolve on this level, it's the most important thing because now you see that person as a mirror. Oh my God, she did amazing. I'm in love with her. I admire her. Wow, she's got it going on. She, she executed today. She, she, she mm. got her behaviors to match her intentions. And I wanna celebrate her. Like, yeah. like, wow, I'm in awe. That to me, you don't work on that. It, you work on you. Mm. Everybody works on themselves and then they bring their best. And if they're not at their best, excuse yourself and get back to your best. And right. if you tell me it's that person or that circumstance, we went back to the unconscious program of being a victim. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with reacting. But the next question is how long? Are you gonna and, stay in this mode? Right, or, yeah. or do you want help getting out, right? Yeah, right? So, so I think that, that when you start feeling those elevated emotions and your energy is synchronized, right? And yeah. it's, you got a Wi-Fi signal. Right. You got a signal. You're connected, you're 5G, you're connected. And you're connected, and what are you connected in? in this sense of wholeness, the sense mm. of love, the sense of joy, this, this, this satisfaction with yourself and your life. And when, I, I mean, I watch this, Lewis. I mean, people come to our events for all kinds of reasons. Uh, some people come for health, some people come for wealth, some people come for relationships. It's really funny and they show up, angry people, <laughs> they're angry with themselves. When they're angry with themselves, they'll be impatient and angry with others. People who are unhappy with themselves will punish other people so that they can feel their unhappiness. Or is it to get their anger out, or is it why? No, because that's who they are. That's, that, that, that's the emotion that's driving their behaviors. 
people who are in love with themselves will find love in others. People who are happy with themselves will find something that they can connect with. They won't see all the flaws. They'll see some part of them that they want to enjoy. I mean, so, hmm. so, so if you're in a relationship and you've scrubbed the, the cupboard, and you've taken out all those skeletons and you've looked at them mm -hmm. and you said, I don't want to bring this into my relationship. I don't want my insecurity to be there. I don't want my fear to be there. I don't want my judgment to be there. I don't want my emotions from other relationships to be there. So let me finish this. In other words, if you want love in your life in your future, then you better take care of your frustration because mm. you can't bring that there. You gotta leave it. So then, well, you may say to me, well, it's because that person and this emotion from 15 years ago, my ex makes me feel frustrated. Well, let me tell you something. The only reason that you're thinking about your ex is because you're still in frustration. You overcome frustration. You'll look back at your ex and you'll be like, I wish them well. Yeah. I'm not connected to my past any longer. So mm. cleaning the cupboards and getting down to those thoughts that slip by people's awareness all the time. Their behaviors, they complain, they make excuses, they say it'll never happen, what do they do? And the emotions that keep them connected to their past, they won't, they won't even see that person. Mm. They'll walk right past their future relationship. They'll never recognize that person because they're looking at their future through the neurology and the chemistry of their past. Wow. And the brain only learns by, only, we only see reality based on pattern recognition. I memorize your face, now I know Lewis. And if the pattern matches, I know. But if you're creating a future, and you're not clear on that future, and you want all these things, but you haven't addressed all those circuits and behaviors and emotions and chemicals of the past, you won't recognize the pattern. You'll walk right past the relationship. You'll never see it. So, so I think that there's wow. the preparation for the relationship, the overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and becoming, Ooh. all of a sudden now says, I am worthy. And the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving. So when you're worthy to receive, it's not gonna be on match.com when you're looking at body parts and whatever else. <laughs> this is gonna be like ka-ching. An like, energy like, connection. Wow, yeah. like that came out of nowhere because <laughs> when you're in survival and you're in separation and you're in lack and you're forcing and controlling and trying to predict outcomes, you're matter trying to change matter. And of course, it's going to take time for this to happen because you're creating a three-dimensional reality and everything in three-dimensional reality takes time. Mm -hmm. But when you're creating from the heart with a coherent brain and a coherent heart and you got that 5G Wi-Fi signal, it's, it's not like you go anywhere now. <laughs> the experiences are coming to, you're drawing the event to you. So, mm. so we spend a lot of time bonding with our future emotionally. I have colleagues of mine who look at our, our data on oxytocin and they're like, uh, listen, oxytocin levels go up during, a, you know, when I'm, when I'm in, a, in a relationship, the honeymoon stage of a relationship and it, a monogamy is created because of those chemicals or uh, a female mammal is bonding with our offspring. That's exactly right. I want our people, our students to bond and fall in love with their future just like they do with somebody else. And when you're bonded to your future, no person, no circumstance, no thing is going to remove you from it. So then, if you fall from grace during the day, then the next question is, what person, what circumstance caused me to disconnect from my love in the future? Mm. And let me rehearse in my mind, if I have that same circumstance, how I'm gonna overcome it. And now you're worthy of love. It's no longer the person or the event, it's just you're doing what it takes to stay in the emotion of your future. You're, your, your body is aligned emotionally to that future. So great doing it with a meditation. That's easy. But now the real game is open your eyes. <laughs> open when your eyes. Happening, it's happening. Open, open your eyes and be in the initiation of life mm. and stay in that place and just yeah. know that your future is going to happen. So, so being able to activate the heart 
and breathe in there and get the body out of survival and start working with it like it feels safe enough to create. Once energy makes it here, you're going to get some really good ideas. Yeah. You're gonna see things you never thought of seeing, you're gonna feel things you never thought you'd feel, and the, the, the images that you're creating, what are they doing? The thoughts that you're creating, they're making more of those chemicals. And now you're feeling more of the, the feeling of your future before it happens. You're, you're giving your body a sampling, mm. a taste of the future before it's happened. Keep doing that enough times and that feeling is gonna become very familiar to you. I think this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. Mm. This is a time in history to know how. And <clears throat> if you rewind the tape 10 years ago, you know, information was the thing that stimulated thought, stimulated new ideas. And, and as we learn new things, we make new connections in our brains. So <clears throat> as we begin to add new stitches into that three-dimensional tapestry in our mind, we're beginning to cause our mind to function in new ways. But the key then, is to apply it, to personalize it, to do something with it. And, and 10 years ago, when I went, got in front of an audience and talked about the application, it, it, nobody wanted to step outside that philosophical, theoretical, intellectual realm, right? Because doing something means you're gonna have to change something about yourself. Painful. Yeah, you're gonna get uncomfortable, yeah. right? And um, <clears throat> I think we're in an age of information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. And because of technology, we have access to so much content and information creates awareness, and awareness is consciousness, and you can't have consciousness without energy. They're, they work together. So there's an energetic change, I think, that's taking place in the world right now where people are so informed that old models, old paradigms are beginning to break down, mm -hmm. whether it's the medical model or the religious model, the education model, journalism, uh, the economy, you know, um, politics. It's all beginning to... Uh, come to the surface because something else has to come out. And, and I think that one of the things that uh, people are realizing is that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk to do this or yeah. uh, a nun with 40 years of devotion. You just gotta understand the formula. And just like any skill or anything you learn, you gotta go from thinking to doing to being. You gotta take knowledge, you, you create the experience, and if you keep doing it over and over again, you start getting a skill or you start getting wise about how to do it. And you, you know that you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, in the last 10 years, we have assembled a scientific team, and let's see if you can really make significant brain changes. I, I don't want those changes to just be in your mind. I want them to be in your brain. I want to be able to see before and after pictures to mm -hmm. say, that person has a significant change after a traumatic brain injury, or anxiety, or depression, or a cyclic mood disorder, or a stroke, we want to see that there's been significant change. At the same time, let's measure your brain in real time and let's look to see what that transformation process looks like. Mm. And in the discovery, Lewis, of that process, we gained so much knowledge about what that transformational process looks like. Right. In other words, I can tell you without a doubt that if you're analyzing your life right now within some disturbing emotion, that 100% of the time you're going to make your brain worse. If you Be think about your life. If you're stuck in an emotion, oh, like you're frustrated, yeah, you're yeah. angry, you're fearful, resentful, resentful, and you're thinking within that emotional state. In other words, mm -hmm. you can't think greater than how you feel. That means then you were thinking in the past because those emotions are a record or residue of the past. So we see people in the, in the process of change that are analyzing and. Uh, uh, in, in duality or polarity, that kind of drives the brain f into higher states of arousal mm. and, and further away from true change. Mm. So we did an, uh, we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of brain scans and, and we now know that there's a formula to create greater brain coherence, greater brain efficiency, to make your brain work better. And when mm. your brain works better, you work better. At the same time, it requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion to begin to change your energy and to change your life. And nobody changes until they change their energy, right? right? So then how do you get a person out of resentment, frustration, into joy and freedom if, why would they feel grateful or joyful or free if the experience hasn't happened? So most mm -hmm. people are spending the majority of their life waiting for something out there to take away their emptiness or pain or the resentment in here. Well if they're, they're waiting their whole life in separation or lack, then, and, and we create reality, then the lack is driving certain thoughts, which is creating more separation and more lack. So teaching people then 
to begin to condition their body emotionally before the evidence takes place in their life is breaking a significant habit, yes. right? So instead of living by cause and effect, now we're beginning to cause and effect. So the moment you start feeling whole and grateful, we now know your healing will begin at that moment. Yes. The moment you start feeling um, worthy and abundant, your wealth is coming. You know, you're generating a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of wealth, and so. How does someone feel worthy though if they've always been told they're not worth it? Yeah. Well, so. Let or, me or that's the story they tell yeah, themselves. Yeah. Like, I'm not worth it because yeah. she didn't say yes when I asked her on a date. Right. Because he broke up with me, because I got yeah. fired, because my parents left me. How do they how am I worth it when yeah. there's so much evidence or story right. around a negative well, thing? Let's stop telling the story of your past and let's start telling the story of your future. And and people who aren't defined by a vision of the future for the most part are left with memories of the past. The, uh -huh. Your brain is a record of the past, it's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced in this moment. So most people wake up in the morning and they start thinking about their problems. Yeah. And those problems are memories that are tattooed in the brain that are associated to certain people and things at certain times and places. So the, moment the person wakes up clean slate, they start thinking about the problems they're thinking in the past. If you believe your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, well, there's a possibility that your past is gonna be your future. Mm. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So then the moment you start recalling the problem, you start feeling unhappy, now your body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you mm. think and how you feel creates a state of being. So people reaffirm their identity based on the past, right? And it turns out that wow. the redundancy of doing that, conditioning only requires, requires an image and an emotion. And most people are unconsciously conditioning their body into the familiar past, into the known. So now if you're in the familiar past and in the known, you're gonna crave the predictable future, right. right? That's the known as well. And there's only one place where the unknown exists and that's the eternal present moment. That's mm. the sweet spot of the generous present moment. So you gotta, you gotta labor to get that person beyond the emotions that keep them tacked or anchored to the past. And yes, it takes an effort to do that, but if you keep working with the formula, you'll reach that elegant moment where there's a liberation of energy. Mm. And now your body, as the unconscious mind, the objective mind is not believing, it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day because you're liberating the body from that emotional state. So you ask a person, why are you so unhappy? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you so resentful? The moment you ask that, their brain is gonna associate that emotion to a past event. Mm, to a memory. To a experience. memory. Yeah. That's because they have nothing to look forward to in their future. So if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, it just means to me that you're more in love with your past mm. than you are with the future. So how do you teach people to believe in a future that they can't see or experience with their senses yet, but they've thought about enough times in their mind that their brain has literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says that's absolutely possible. Mm. We know that. And how do you teach a person to select a new possibility in their future and begin to emotionally embrace that future before it's made manifest to such a degree that their body as their unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present mm -hmm. moment and they're signaling new genes and new ways ahead of the environment. Now, to their body begins to change to look like the event has already occurred. We've proven that that's possible. Now think about this. So the more you think about your desired future, the joy, the gratitude, the, uh, the feelings you want to have that are more positive, the more you think about it as, it's, as a future thing happening, the more your body shifts now. Exactly. So your body is believing it's living in that future reality now. in the present moment. Now think about this. The stronger the emotion you feel from some condition in your life, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you narrow your focus on the cause and the brain freezes an image and takes a snapshot. And that memory now is embossed in the brain. It's branded in there. So then people think neurologically within the circuits of those past experiences and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And the stronger the betrayal, the stronger the trauma, the more the body's living in the past, right? right so yeah. then, so how do you reverse that? So now, if you truly got passionate about a future, we've all done this. You get a wild idea in your mind and uh -huh. you start holding on to that vision and you're preoccupied with it. 
all of a sudden the thought in your mind becomes the experience and you start feeling the the energy of the future. Yeah. Now, the stronger the emotion you feel from that vision, the more you're going to pay attention to the picture in your mind and now you're remembering your future. And vice and, versa, the stronger you pay attention to the feeling of the past pain, you're going to create the pain in this moment. Exactly. So then, so it requires a coherent brain mm -hmm. and we now know that there's a formula for that and we've got beautiful research to show that people can do it. They just have to practice. And it requires a coherent heart because resentment, frustration, impatience creates a very incoherent heart. <laughs> yeah. And when that heart becomes incoherent, you stop trusting yourself. There's no energy there. You, get, you stop trusting in your future. Wow. So then if there's physical evidence in your brain and body, physical evidence to look like the event has already occurred, it's quite possible you'll be thinking neurologically within the circuits of your future and you'll begin to feel chemically within the boundaries of that emotion of your future mm -hmm. and how you think and how you feel is your state of being. And now your state of being is living in the future instead of the past. Now, the moment you disconnect from the emotion of your future because of traffic or some coworker or your ex or whatever people come up with, now you're back to the energy of your past. Oh. And now you're gonna start looking for it, analyzing why hasn't it happened? Well. If you're feeling the emotion of your future, why would you look for it? Because you would feel like it already happened and that mm. is the place where the magic happens. So then you can't just do this, get up and then return back to your old state of being. You gotta maintain that modified state How of mind. How do you maintain it that's, when, when that's life practice. happens? Well, let me finish. If I punch it, you in the face right now, how do you maintain <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, of course. I mean, we all take blows in our lives yeah. and, and we all react emotionally. But the question is, how long are you going to react? Right, right. I'll so see. then if you can't mediate and regulate your emotional mm -hmm. reactions and those emotions linger for days. That's years mood. Years for some people. Mood. And then months, temperament, years, personality trait. So then the person's personality is literally based on the past. Crazy. But they don't know that because they're doing it over and over again, it becomes a subconscious program. So now, if it requires a coherent brain and a coherent heart, then we have to train people uh -huh. how to self-regulate. So we've done thousands and thousands of measurements. We've partnered with the HeartMath Institute to teach people how to create and sustain heart coherence. How do we do it? Well, besides going to your workshop, what's the simplified version? I'm sure it takes more time than well, it really doesn't. Oh. It really doesn't. It just requires getting still, closing your eyes, putting your attention on your heart, changing your breath so that you move into the present moment. And when you slow your breathing down, you slow your brain waves down. When you slow your brain waves down, now you're accessing your autonomic nervous system. So then you train a person how to open their heart and feel an elevated emotion. And it takes a little practice. And just like a flower that, that takes time to bloom, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. takes a little bit of time. But if mm -hmm. you work in trading the resentment, the frustration or the impatience for gratitude, appreciation and thankfulness, and you keep at it, there'll come a moment where that system switches on and now you're feeling grateful for no reason at all. Right. That's, that's not a bad <laughs> thing because gratitude, the emotional signature of gratitude means something's happening to you something has happened to you, yeah. you're receiving something or you just received something. So your body then, when you're feeling gratitude, is in the perfect state of receiving. Mm -hmm. So then that means then you'll accept, believe and surrender to the thoughts equal to the emotional state of gratitude. Mm -hmm. If you're living in resentment, you're living in fear, you're living in, in, in patience, you could say I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm with all you want and that thought's gonna stop right at the brainstem and never make its way to the body because the because body is not feeling or because why? Because you're feeling resentment. Uh -huh. And that thought isn't the, that thought is not consistent with the emotion of resentment. Resentment has a different set of thoughts, right? In other words, once you start opening your heart, it begins to move into coherence. It begins to produce a measurable magnetic field up to three meters wide. Now that's frequency, that's energy. And all that energy, that frequency carries information, carries an intent. So then when you're feeling gratitude and your heart is open, you're broadcasting energy into the mm -hmm. field. A now, frequency. A yeah. frequency. You lay the intent of the thought of your health or your wealth. That frequency can carry the thought of your wealth. It can mm. carry the thought of your health. If you're suffering, 
you can't, the suffering does not carry, that energy does not carry the thought of your wealth. It carries a different set of thoughts. So then, so then we're teaching people how to self-regulate because if you're going to believe in that future that you're imagining with all of your heart, it better be open and activated right, right. and you better know how to self-regulate and you have to know the moment you disconnect from the energy of your future because of some circumstance in your life and you lose that feeling, if you're practicing it on a daily basis with your eyes closed, then the next level is to be able to open your eyes and do it right in the moment mm. and be able to self-regulate and change the, the frustration from some experience in your life back to the energy of your future. Now, that requires great awareness and great effort, but if you have a community of people that are practicing this on a daily basis and they're connected to their future because that's where in their mind is, mm -hmm. um, they begin to want the future more than the emotions the of the past. So we've done enough measurements now, Lewis, to know that we can teach people how to do that and we have evidence that people can sustain it for 45 minutes to an hour. It's a skill now. They know yeah. that they know how to do it. So now they have brain coherence and heart coherence. Well, once the heart begins to become orderly and coherent, it acts as an amplifier and it drives mm. energy to the brain. So now the brain is getting more energy once the heart is open and then you're thinking a different set of thoughts. And those thoughts produce different chemicals for you to feel more of that. And here comes uh, nitric oxide from oxytocin mm. and then all of a sudden your heart literally starts to swell. It literally begins to open up and there's more energy going there and now you're coming from a different level of mind. Right. So then what about what happens to your immune system when you do that? Well, it turns out we've done an experiment just 10 minutes a day, three times a day with 120 people trading resentment, frustration, fear for gratitude, mm -hmm. appreciation and thankfulness, measuring their immune response. The, the chemical immunoglobulin A, your primary defense against bacteria and viruses, the best flu shot you'll ever get lives right. with, innately within you. Turns out when you're frustrated, when you're impatient, when you're fearful, the immune system dials down because you're an emergency. It's not, it's, all your energy is going for some threat in your outer world. There's no energy in your inner world for growth and repair. But how do you turn that around? So then as people begin to open their heart, can that chemical begin to, to um, elevate. Mm -hmm. Four days, 50% change in the 120 people. Their, their IGA levels went up 50% in four days. Wow. That's, your body's immune system is now upregulating genes that are making proteins and immunoglobulins and, and antibodies that you don't need a flu shot. In other words, your inner state is greater than your outer world. Mm -hmm. So then just by doing that, we now know that your immune system is going to get stronger by the same means. Take 120 people or 50 people and measure 7,500 gene regulations, okay? In four days, two genes that suppress cancer growth and tumors are activated and upregulated. The genes that stimulate stem cells to go to damaged tissues and repair them, upregulated. The gene for oxidative balance is upregulated, anti-cancer, anti-aging, mm. anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, just your body's naturally doing this. The gene for neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons in response to novel experiences and learning. This is four days, the mm. gene switches on. Uh, the, the gene for uh, more balance in the pituitary and the pancreas, the gene for the microtubules of the cells, the, the little, the little fibers that respond to energy and frequency. Right. So in four days, we now know that you can change your genetic destiny if you just practice the inner work. We have research to show that 60 days of meditation, five days a week, will lengthen your life. The right. telomeres, the little shoestrings on the end of your DNA get longer. That means your biological age is changing. So we, we have the evidence now to show people what's possible. We have brain scans that are, that are so outside of normal that when neuroscientists see them, they're blown away because the amount of energy that's in the brain during this transcendental moment is uh, hundreds of times outside of normal. Wow. I mean, you can't make your brain do that. Something is happening to you and that person's having a transcendental moment. And we mm. now know that we can predict it and we now that know that we can induce it. So then there's the evidence there. Mm -hmm. Then you take our community and you see people with stage four cancer, with Parkinson's disease, with myasthenia gravis, with 
with lupus, with MS, with uh, brain injuries, uh, uh, with rare genetic disorders, with uh, vertigo, uh, tinnitus, uh, all, uh, kidney failure, all kinds of health conditions come to a week-long event and then at the end of that event they make significant strides in getting beyond the emotions of the past. Now think about this. The science says that the environment signals the gene, that's epigenetics. Mm -hmm. The end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. So as long as you're living by the same emotion every single day, you're signaling the same gene in the same way. And if that gene is related to a survival emotion, a stress hormone, then you're down-regulating the gene and you're creating disease. So when the person trades that emotion and really breaks free from the chains of their past, and now they're feeling an elevated emotion, well, now they're dialing down the gene for MS, mm -hmm. and they're upregulating the gene for health and balance. And so the person, will you'll say to them, where's the disease? Well, I'm not the same person. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not the, and, and the side effect of that is a transformation in healing. So the funny thing about it is the person who has the healing is not talking about the healing. Whether it's blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, hearing we have crazy evidence now. What they're talking about is how amazing they feel mm -hmm. because they're refreshed, they're, 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 they got a new lease on life. Yeah. And so now we have evidence in our research and that silences the critic to, to show that what's possible for people. And now we have evidence and testimony that we have evidence where people will stand on the stage and say, hey, I broke my back in three places. I, I haven't been able to stand up straight. I came into this event hunched over. I couldn't lay down. And now this guy's jumping around on the stage. He's laying on his back. He's touching his toes. He's, mm -hmm. he's, you can tell. I mean, this is, is you, he's, he's having his moment. We freed, we changed somebody. Yeah. Someone with Parkinson's disease can't swallow, mm. can't chew, can't blow her nose, can't stand up. One moment, one moment, the next thing you know, <clears throat> she's blowing her nose, chewing, swallowing. We changed her body. We changed her life and we changed her future. And she doesn't look like a movie star and she doesn't look like she's a vegetarian and she doesn't look like she's buffed. She just looks like a normal person. Now the person in the audience who's watching that and looking at this person and seeing that they're no different than them, it just starts to mm. cause them to think if someone else can do it, I can do it. So you see the person with the stage four cancer that got the, you know, the voodoo curse that they have three months to live. And now they have no evidence of cancer in their body and they're standing on the stage telling wow. that story and somebody in the audience is checking her out going, I have the same condition and if she can do it, I'm going to step right in that footprint and I'm going to do it wow. the way she did it. And all of a sudden you start seeing this change in the community in a week long event because once there's a breakthrough, right? I mean, it's like a four minute mile. Everyone it's it, it's, it, it's yeah. in the field, you yeah. know? And, but it's not only in the field, you're seeing evidence in three dimensional reality yeah. and in evidence is the loudest voice right now. Yeah. And so people don't want to see talking heads. Anybody can see it on the internet. Information is readily available. What they want to see is evidence. And so when you have evidence in the scientific realm and then you have evidence in a, in a, in a, in a community of people and it, you're not doing anything that's so extreme that, that, that excludes anybody, it's inclusive and mm -hmm. we're using science as the contemporary language of mysticism. Mm. It is science that's gonna demystify the mystical. If I talk tradition, culture, religion, any of those things, spiritual principles, people are gonna shut off. You're gonna divide an audience. But science creates community. Right. So, so by building a scientific model, I don't subscribe to any type of meditation because I, I look at the evidence of what we've gathered in, let's see, by applying this formula, to what extent can we prove to human beings how powerful they really are? And, and I think that that has become something that has mystified me because when I see blind people seeing in our workshops, I have to tell you <laughs> that I'm more surprised than anybody. I'm <laughs> yeah. standing up there shaking my head and, and we, have, we have great evidence. This, you know, one woman was, uh, she's a nurse and um, one day she just uh, uh, wakes up and she's got a blind spot in her eye. <clears throat> she can't see in the lower left-hand quadrant of, of both eyes, six o'clock to nine o'clock. Wow. She goes, to, she's a nurse, she goes to see her, her colleagues. Um, they do a scan, stroke uh, on the optic nerve. Wow. Uh, 
and now she's uh, legally blind. Uh, she can't drive her car, she runs her own company, she can't run her company, she can't type, she can't use the computer. She's compromised in a big way. Now with a stroke, you have two weeks really, that's the window. And if nerve cells are going to come back online, it's going to be those first two weeks. Wow. If they don't come back, the prognosis is live with it. Whether you have paralysis or whatever, that if a stroke causes brain damage in usually two to three weeks, you don't see many, much change. So they gave her the, you know, the, the prognosis. You have to learn to accommodate and wow. live with it. And so she, she, she wasn't satisfied with that answer. And she goes to one of her dear friends who's a physician. And the physician says, go check out the Spenza guy. And she says, why don't you come with me? So they come to our event in Brighton in, in the UK Was together. this within the three weeks or was this later? Do you know? Oh, no, this is a year later. Wow. This is a year later. And so it's supposed to be irreversible at yeah. that point. And so um, she comes to the event, and then she comes to the event for two reasons. To listen to this, to learn how to live with her handicap. That's the extent of what's possible and have in her more mind. Peace and, yeah. 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 And, and then create a nonprofit to help people. Those were her two things. Mm. So somewhere in the middle of the event, where, where, uh, she, it occurs to her that she could actually possibly heal her eyes. Mm. So she goes for it. She lays down after one of the meditations, we lay down at the end, and all of a sudden, like in her head, she starts feeling this heat and this crackling sensation. Now, you have one of two options when something like this happens. You get scared you and get run scared, away. You get scared, it's the unknown, you <laughs> yeah. contract, like, uh, and your brain goes into high beta and you disconnect. Something's wrong, I'm, right, right. I'm hurting something. Yeah, I'm having another stroke, whatever. Or you surrender and, and wax dive, into it. Yeah, you go in. Yeah. And she, she let go. and. She, she had the most incredible experience. She laid there for the longest time, opened her eyes, and she said it was like the lights came back on. She said, wow. I could see completely. We sent her for a scan. The Monday morning after that week-long wow. event, the scan that had the, the left lower quadrant on both eyes from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock was black. The post-scan, there isn't one black spot wow. anywhere on, the, on her eyes. Because she'd already done a scan a year prior. Yeah, 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 yeah. She had the scan. So wow. we'll, 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 give you the, we'll give you the evidence. But, but that is not natural. Wow. That's not normal. But, but how do you explain that in conventional science? I mean, the truth is, is that we have incredibly powerful innate qualities mm. for regeneration and healing mm -hmm. once you hit that button. So then she stands in the audience and gives her testimony. Other people are going to begin to realize that they can heal from a stroke. And that's exactly what's happening. A collective consciousness is, is happening. We're uncovering some really powerful truths for people to like really embrace. Mm -hmm. Like I keep telling the scientists, I can't believe this is the truth. I tell them that, like, I can't believe this is the truth. We have the evidence right there that, you could make your brain work better in four days. You could make your heart work better in four days. You could make you could make your immune system fifty percent stronger in four days. You could you could regulate eight different genes in four days that are all promoting neurogenesis and stem cell production and and oxidative balance and all kinds of wonderful things. Cellular structures enhanced. All of this stuff is really cool because. If you don't know that that's possible, mm. right, then it doesn't exist for you, right? Like, if you're, if you're unconscious to the fact that you could heal yourself, you'll make the same choice as you always do. So, so I'm challenged in my own way at a different level to, to, to do my best, to do the right, make the right choices all the time. And sometimes those choices, um, I, can't, I can't rely on anybody else but me to make those choices mm -hmm. because nobody else knows what it's like to be me than me. Even right. my closest friends think they know me, but, they, but when it comes down to making the choice, it's a, it's a lonely moment, right? Because I'm doing my best to try to preserve this work and to inspire people to apply it in their lives yes. as many ways as I can. So, so, I, so a lot of times I get discouraged, like, oh my God, like another challenge, another challenge. But, you know, I think, you know, when I'm truly in the right zone, I... I, I think the only way that we actually can grow in our lives is to be challenged, right? So, and I, and I think that I think uh, the greater the greater we evolve or the greater we become, I think the greater the challenges, you know. And so, so I'm, I have my own set of challenges that I have to really retreat from my life 
I have to spend a lot of time alone, and I really? have to remember that vision, and I have to, and I have to, I have to get beyond all those other things that say, "Wow, my God, this is this might be a good time for you to quit," or really? this is a good time for you to say, "Wow, this is getting pretty intense." What, what would you say is the biggest challenge? Is it the internal conversation about just? No, there's just it's just a lot of moving parts. We have yeah. a, we have a, a big we have team. A big team. We have we run events for thousands month, of yeah. people. We have staff. We have volunteers. We have scientists. We have. Uh, papers. I mean, we have uh, growth. We have websites, social media. Yeah. You know, we have. It's, it's all just a, a lot, lot of moving parts. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. And and so, I think for me personally, I, I don't. I guess I could say this is, is that that um, what I love to do more than anything else is to create. Right. I mean, the meditations that I develop and the things that I think about and the music that we work on creating, all that stuff. We've got great science to sh I know now mm -hmm. what music works. I know what words work. I know the rhythm. I know the cadence. I know the mathematics of music that works really well. So like that stuff is the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff. That's where I want to be in the studio yeah. and with the sound and making the right meditations for people to but I'm running, you know, I'm running a lot. I'm doing a lot of things over here. So the balance in my life to be able to make time for myself and the people that I love uh, and and keep that private and keep that special and at the same time interface with the world and and provide them the tools to make measurable changes in their lives and you know you come up against a lot of challenges uh, in that process yeah. what do you think will be the biggest challenge you face over the next few years oh either, gosh either gosh. personally professionally spiritually um, I physically think, yeah no I, I just I really just think it's my uh, it's 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 my balance you know I mean and we run I mean we run a week-long event I'm once a month yeah, right. we're, but we're going, you know, six, five in the morning till till seven, eight at night, and and but it doesn't matter to me because that's the easy part. Being at an event is like a spiritual rave. I mean, wow. our events are <laughs> our events are like nothing you'll ever see. I've heard I've had so many people go yeah, yeah. that listen to our interviews, yeah. and they go, yeah. and they're just like, yeah. it's incredible. You have to come. So yeah. this year. You're not, allowed, you're not allowed. I'm to come. I'm yeah, sneaking in. I'm come. breaking no, through you security. Can't come. You can't come here. <laughs> Disguising myself. <laughs> but I mean, I have. Here. Look, I have a lot of challenges. I have a lot of challenges, just like anybody. I'm no different than you. You know, I react. You know, of course. And you know, the the question I have for myself is, how long you're going to do that yeah. for? Like, how long are you going to keep that up? Like, right. well, you know better. So, so defaulting and remembering, I think, is is such a great thing for us to do. So I work on that. Um, so you might default to a, a reaction for, and you give yourself, what, an hour or two hours? No, I, I, well, I try, you know, I try to keep it under <laughs> 10, 15 minutes, but well, then it's sometimes Well, of course, sometimes, sometimes it's easier than others, just like anything else. What's the biggest trigger for you, I'm curious? What's the thing that gives you a default reaction that you're like, ah, I know I need to improve that? God, I, I um, I think I think the thing that I care the most about is is really just keeping this work as pure as possible. I think I care a lot about that. Do so, people try to not try to muck it up or something? Well, there's always there's always variations of it, you know. Uh -huh. So I, I guess I, if you were if I was really honest, I would want to say that I would want to keep it as pure as possible. That's what I work on. How do you keep it pure? What's pure mean? Well, just just in its in its in its an origin it's in its original version, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your your morning and evening meditation is incredible. I don't know if people yeah. well that's that's a great example of metacognition. That's a great example of reminding yourself of who you want to be and who you no longer want to be, and then check in at the end of the day. You say, "I had a whole lifetime today. How did I do?" Incredible. Yeah. And, yeah. And your evening meditation, I listen to the morning one and the evening uh, often. And the evening one, you have this thing where it's like, "How did I show up? Did I show up as my best version of myself?" Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. And that I do so the we, things I said I was going to do, and, yeah. you know, and it's a beautiful reminder to have having accountability. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Accountability is one of the three things that creates excellence. You know, you, accountability is is basically owning what you say you're going to do or what you're asked to do. The other element, of course, is competence. You got to be really good at it. And if it takes you your whole life to get good at it, get good at it. And if you have a vision or a mission that's bigger than you, and you put those three things together. You have a lot of excellence in an individual. Mm -hmm. Vision bigger than you. Yeah, you got to be able to master your craft. You got to you got to be really accountable and responsible for yourself. You got to own yourself, and you got to have that vision, and you got to keep that vision alive. And that's heading in a direction. Vision, purpose, mission is ongoing. You could have a mission to be healthy. You could have a mission to be wealthy. You could have a mission. You could have a purpose to be you know 
uh, to gain knowledge. There's never an end, right? right? So it's a direction. The goals we set up along the line of our vision are just to remind us that we're still on course, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't arrive at those goals, then we've lost our vision. Do you feel like each individual should f have a vision statement for their personal no. or professional life? No. Or just have an idea no. of a vision in your no. mind? No, I think it's really important for us to be curious. I mean, I'm the best when I wonder. Mm -hmm. Like I say, I always say, Joe Dispenza, what do you know? Sit down, don't turn your phone on, shut it off, ask, answer the question. What do you know? Like, what do you, you really believe you create reality? At what point do you stop believing that, you know? I mean, I really, I want to know. I want to think that through all the way because I think the more we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, I think the how gets easier, mm -hmm. right? So I spend a lot of time reviewing knowledge and information and thinking about ways to teach it better or easier for people that make it more practical, yes. more simple. And I can tell you there's such a quickening going on in our culture right now. People are so ready to really embrace this information. They've had it doing mm -hmm. another way in other ways. And 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 so so taking that time to really think and contemplate is such an important process because when it gets stale and it gets routine and it gets boring. You just forgot what you were doing and why you're doing it, right? And right. sign the back up and relearn it. You get down to the basics again. What was the biggest discovery you found in the last five to 10 years based on practicing, trying, learning, research? What was the thing yeah. that was like, wow, this is, a, this is a new thing or a thing I thought that was gonna work and it's actually working? Yeah, wow, I don't know if we have enough time for that, but we have, <laughs> we, we have well, the research that we're doing right now, Lewis, um, I'll give you an example, like a, tr a drug study. You know, when you do a drug study, it's about 18 to 25% correlative cause and effect, right? Uh -huh. our, our studies are 75% cause and effect. There's wow. no pharmaceutical that looks anything like our studies. And the amount of wonderful metabolites that are being created in people's bodies. What is a metabolite? It's a, like a cell is releasing information. Like what is, what is the information? Is that the cell is saying I'm in growth or I'm in trouble, I'm in emergency, I'm in, I'm, I'm in disease, uh -huh. right? So in seven days at a week long event, we'd, we discovered that people make thousands of different metabolites to show that their body is in a very different environment, very healthy environment. And, and then when they walked in, then, in the beginning. Yeah, and when they walked, dramatic changes. And I keep saying to the scientists, where are those chemicals coming from? Where are they coming from? They're certainly not coming from some pill that you're taking. It's coming from within us. Mm -hmm. Our nervous system is the greatest pharmacy in the world. I mean, you take blood from an advanced meditator that hits a certain brainwave state we capture that moment of connection. There's information in their blood that causes them to be immune to viruses, any virus. You take the blood of the advanced meditator and you subject it to a uterine cancer cell and 70% of the energy is diminished in the cancer cell. Lights are out. Mm. That, that it just shuts it down. Shuts it down. What do cancer cells want to do? They want to move and they, they want grow. to multiply. Yeah, yeah. So if you take away energy, they can't move, they can't multiply. It's, 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 it's exactly what we're seeing in our testimonials. You take the blood of an advanced meditator and you subject to a neuron, it downregulates the gene for Alzheimer's. Like there's wholeness. There's 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 information in that in the, in the chemistry of their blood that's not coming from anywhere out there. Their eyes are closed. The music's playing in the background. Right. They're not eating, they're not eating, they're, they're, they're not doing, they're sitting still. They're not being massaged, they're not having like they're liquid be, they're, dry. They're, they're, right, they're, they're not taking any injections, IVs no now. IVs, no. They're, they're, they're making strong compounds in their body. That's from within. From within. Is that them. from thought into brain, into heart, body? How it, does that? No, back to our, our original conversation yes. about putting our attention on matter and putting our attention on energy. Well, the quantum field, right, is, you know, you look at reality, it's a particle and the wave, right? The particle is matter, the wave is energy. Okay, so um, it's a scientific fact that we perceive less than 1% of reality. And as a matter of fact, the mathematics say it's 100% that we perceive less than 1% of reality. So don't exclude yourself yes. from that as well. So okay. we're missing out on a lot, 
right? Okay. So our perceptions, our faculties are only perceiving 1% of what's actually real. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So our sight, our, our we're, taste, we're our smell, everything. only 1% yeah. of our reality, of what's yeah. actually, yeah. 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 wow. Yeah. So we're missing out on a lot. So even if we could get to two or three percent, it'd be a whole new world. Called enlightenment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so so then so then what we teach people to do is take their attention off the particle, off matter, uh -huh. and put it on energy. And you can't experience that energy with your senses. So you can experience it with your awareness. Okay. So mm -hmm. what happens? Okay. Yes. Person changes their brain waves from high beta that aroused state we talked about earlier. They start sensing space. Their brain waves slow down to alpha. Why? Because when you're sensing, you're not analyzing and thinking. And if you're not analyzing and thinking, you're not in beta. So you start dropping down and the brain switches to alpha. And in alpha, your inner world tends to be more real than your outer world. Alpha is a creative state. Okay. So in beta, the voice in your head is always talking to you. Do this, do that, it's a, that default, right? In, in alpha, the voice kind of goes away and you see more in images and pictures. You're dreaming, right? You're, you're remembering stuff and it's more, it's more imagery, right? So it's an imaginary state. When we see people move into that state, they don't just move into any kind of alpha. They move into that coherent alpha. Now the whole brain is in cadence. It's, it's sending out very strong signals, right? If you can get a person dialed down into theta where they're completely relaxed, the body is so relaxed that it's resting in a light sleep. Yes. And they're still awake and they're conscious. The door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is wide open to information. In fact, theta is a hypnotic state. Um, so when you're mm -hmm. being hypnotized, you're suggestible to whatever somebody's telling you, right? But if you're in a meditation and you're suggestible to information, but your eyes are closed, there's music playing in the background, you're disconnected from your environment, there's only one other place information can come from, and that's frequency. Frequency carries information. Wi-Fi signals, radio waves, TV waves, they're all carrying information and that antenna decodes it, okay. It's just kind of crazy when you think about it. You know, 10 years ago, if you'd have said, hey, you're gonna have a, a, a physical device and you can see someone in across the world. Yeah. We'd have been like, what? How's yeah, this even possible? So Star Trek, right? It's crazy, yeah. right? So, so, so that's exactly what the brain does. It transduces frequency into very profound experiences internally. And when that happens, the person is suggestible to information. The more coherent their brain and heart is, the more there's a resonance between the unified field, which is an orderly field, there's order, and the order in their brain, and the brain can decode frequency, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the person goes into these brilliant, brilliant states of high gamma, not a little gamma, not a lot of gamma. And what happens when we're in a high state of gamma? They're in they're in a very aroused state. Now the <laughs> spiritually arous aroused. No, the arousal is not fear. Okay. The arousal is not pain, and the arousal is not uh, uh, aggression. The arousal is ecstasy. The person mm -hmm. is feeling a very familiar, unfamiliar feeling where they feel like they forgot something that they knew all their entire life. They start connecting to energy and they, they, there's no word. People say bliss, ecstasy, more love than I could ever explain. I'm so grateful. Transcendence, like, whatever. You whatever mean. that is. And we actually can induce that state. We can predict it and we can replicate it. And the scans look exactly the same. They, and it's not the thinking brain that is in that aroused state. The lights are out there. It's they're in theta. They're shut up. It's, it's the, the limbic brain, the seat of the autonomic nervous system, that's sending such fast, coherent information to every single cell in the body, and it's energy that's touching the cell. And the person feels like they're electric. They wow. feel like they're, like they're, they're, they're there's an awakening that takes place. Now, what comes with that? Many times is a biological upgrade. Energy starts to inform matter. There's a tumor. Now it's gone. There's the Parkinson's. Now it's gone. There's the eczema. Now it's, it's gone. Gone. You see this all the time. With yeah, your it's kind of wild. Yeah, yeah. So, so, we're, so what we're doing is we're drawing the blood from people at the that event. have that that ex that have that experience right after they have that experience, really? and 24 hours later, and we're finding the most incredible things in that blood. That's why I keep saying, where is that? In where is that? Where is that? All those chemicals coming from? Where are those? It's not from the medicine. It's so cool. It's coming from within us, right? So, 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 the data that we have. We did the largest microbiome study uh, in in the world. Actually, wow. we we did a thousand people, and we had um, you know measured uh, uh, you know micro, human microbiome. And there's more cells that that live in your body than the cells that make up your body, and they have dramatic 
influences on so many different functions in our body. And in just the, our preliminary studies, we saw the, the microbiome that's associated with cancer growth dramatically reduced. Wow. We saw the microbiome that's associated with, with inflammation dramatically reduced. We found the microbiome that causes a person to be resistant from treatment for cancer significantly reduced. Like you're just finding all this crazy stuff. When these scientists are, are seeing this data that they're working with the people that come into your events and they're seeing this massive reduction. They were all skeptics, by the way. Yeah, and what yeah. do they say when they see okay. the results? Are they like, no, no, nah. no, in the beginning, they were running the tests, the same tests, over and over again, <laughs> expecting to get a different result. Yeah. And, and I said to them, you're changing your belief you're doing that right now. You're changing a belief right now. They're looking and seeing, oh my God, cells are not behaving the way they should in this plasma. Let's run it again. It's, let's run it again. <laughs> then back. let's do it another way. Yeah. Let's do it, and they tried all the different ways and they're like, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. This is, this is, we've never seen anything like this before. So again, why is that important? The testimony of the person who stands on the stage and says, I didn't have $2 to rub together and now I, I'm worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The person who says I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, it was in my bones, it was in my liver, it was in my lungs, it was in my, you know, my, my pelvic organs. This is not a drop of cancer in her blood. And this happens all the time. It's the four minute mile. It's the person in the audience who's mm -hmm. looking at, looking at truth. That person's the example of truth. Truth is right in front of them. And the story is not glamorous. You know, they got worse before they got better. They're, they lost things. The doctors told them they were gonna die. I mean, they had every reason to give up on themselves. Mm -hmm. And man, when you hear those stories, I mean, the whole audience is in tears. And invariably, somebody in the room is looking at them and saying, if he can do it, I can do it. Yes. Invariably, when we put up that data, the scientists put it up. I, I always say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying this. The data is saying that. Like when people see that data, they're so encouraged. Mm. That's the truth. That's the truth. Like wow, we are greater than we think. We're more powerful than we know. We're more unlimited than we could ever dream. Right, and we're just starting to push that envelope a little bit. And we have never been disappointed. We 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 do these experiments with random event generators, right? With what? A random event generator. Random event generator. generator. Like so, it's a sophisticated uh, coin toss. Uh -huh. And you toss a coin, you keep tossing it. Uh, the more you toss it, the more it's gonna be 50-50. 50% heads, 50% sales. The more you toss it, it's gonna be the 50% average. So this programmed machine flips a coin a thousand times in one second. We get a collective wow. network of observers, a collective consciousness of people that are all resonating at the same frequency. We teach them how to do that. And the moment they go into a certain state, <laughs> random events are no longer random and they become very intentional. In other words, they're influencing a machine that's programmed to go 50-50 to behave in a very different way. They're, they're, their energy is somehow altering the mechanism of a machine. Huh, really? Over and over again. So then, okay, so something's happening where random events are no longer random, they're becoming more intentional, and, and the collective network of observers that have brain and heart coherence somehow can produce measurable effects in reality. Okay, so then we said, God, it happened every time. Let's take cells and let's program these bacterial cells to either make a red protein or a green protein. And it's a 50-50 shot too. And of course, if you look at a colony of bacteria, you see this kind of brownish color. And if you get really close, there's red ones and there's green ones. And mm. it's usually 50-50. You get a whole group of people together and I tell them to focus on green. Come and on. all of a sudden, the colony of cells switch over Come to Come on. Wow. So, so, so again, so again, like if you don't know that that's possible, You'd be skeptical. You'd be skeptical, but but Probably. the scientists are scratching their heads saying, I'm, we're up all night trying to figure this stuff <laughs> out, right? Like, what, are they, what are they saying is the cause of it? What there, are they... there has to be some quantum entanglement, so we're bringing in quantum, really? quantum theorists, you know, theoretical physicists, information physicists. We have uh, you know, just all kinds of uh, different, we're doing uh, functional MRIs now, you know, looking at brains, we're doing, we have, we can, we can actually study brains when people are walking now. I mean, we're just, we're just, we're trying to piece together 
what exactly it is. And and so, to me, that's a good reason to get up in the morning. To but me, keep uh, learning and discovering and creating. And <laughs> every time we do an experiment, every time we do an experiment, we're never disappointed. And the cool thing about it, more than anything else, for me, is that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk. You don't have to have 40 years of devotion. You don't have to, in fact, it's better off that you don't. A lot of guys that come that their girlfriends or their wives bring them, they're just like, hey, dude, listen, <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know anything about this. Those are the guys that do the best. Kind of forced to come. Yeah, no, yeah. they come and they're like, I don't know anything. Just tell me what to do. Yeah, they do yeah. exactly what we tell them to do. We had, we had some really, really um, elite forces, you know, come recently mm. that, you know, that those guys had some, some rough roads, you know, yeah, with trauma, trauma and stuff. Yeah. Completely different guys. Wow. Completely different guys. I mean, completely Different. Let's say you make a million dollars in your business, but then you invest a lot in the stock market or whatever, and then half of it goes away overnight. Who doesn't have that happen? Right. Every abundant person has that happen, right. and, and and their response is minimal. So, what should be people be thinking when they lose a lot of money, or they lesson, lose something? Don't lose the lesson. Uh, you may lose the money, but don't lose the lesson. Should people feel this emotional attachment to the money no, loss? No, why? Or just why? Say, what, is, okay. what is money? I mean, what is that? What people really want. It's like people say to me, oh, I have this great idea for this new business and, and I need money. And I say, you don't need money. You need opportunity. Mm -hmm. You need opportunity. You better tune in to some opportunities, right? So it's the framing of how limited we think that we have to get things through money. It just is not the way it is. Yeah. So the fundamental importance about all of this is I, I really don't care if people want to be abundant. I don't care if they want to heal. I don't care if they want to have a mystical. I don't care what when I travel the world. It doesn't matter to me. I just want them to be in the experiment. The experiment of actually trying it out yes. and seeing, God, if I really change my energy, well, could I actually have an effect that's produced in my life? And if I'm waiting for the event to occur, I'm back to the illusion of separation and lack, mm -hmm. waiting for it to happen, to take it away, if I'm truly a creator. So let's say, let's say they're not waiting. What should they do instead of waiting? Keep feeling the feeling in the present moment and trust. Look, right? if you're, will, if you're waiting, you're not creating. I mean, that's just the mm -hmm. way it is. So wake up every day. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want your dream? It's so much easier to forget that vision than to remember it, right? So yes. if you're gonna remember it, you gotta keep it alive in your mind. How do you keep it alive in your mind? You, you disconnect from your environment, you close your eyes, you play music in the background. You, get, you sit your body down and it's gotta pee and it's gotta eat and it's gotta, well, you just, <laughs> just sit down for a few minutes, yes. like training a dog, like yeah. stay. When I say it's time to get up, we get up. Don't be thinking about what's gonna happen in your day, you already know what's gonna happen. Don't think what happened yesterday, you already know that. Get in the present moment, and say, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? Who do I want to be today? What would mm -hmm. greatness look like? How, right. how, would, how would I, how would, well, one day, one shot, one lifetime, what would an abundant person do? Let me rehearse that with my eyes closed. Let me remind myself who I don't want to be. Let me remind myself of who do I want to be. Let's not get up, Lewis. Until we get into that. Until we are, to where the tennis ball hits the sweet spot. When you go, oh, I'm ready for the day now. now Game on. Now, if you can maintain that modified state of mind and body the entire day without defaulting by seeing someone or doing something, stay in that state, you, the experiment still continues. And you're changing your energy. Doesn't happen in two days, you're not that good. Right. That's it. You're not that good. We keep practicing. Keep, people who show up the, for the 21 weeks in a row, this woman, 21 weeks in a row, the end of 21 weeks, she knew it. Boom. Her whole life changed. Boom. Was it 21 days worth it? Ask her. The experiment, she was just changing the process. People who diagnose with really serious health conditions and they start doing the meditations and they realize, wow, God, my body feels better, my pain feels better, but my values, my scans are still showing the disease exists. All right, did it, does it mean that it doesn't work? No, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means like, what am I doing the other 15 hours of the day? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm in lack, I'm in fear, I'm responding to the same people in the same uh -huh. ways. And you gotta think about this. As long as your response to everything in your life is the same, you're not changing. Right. So change your response to things in your life and you're in the process of change. So then, now I gotta get good with my eyes open. Now I gotta be able to rehearse, oh my God, I fell from grace. 
at that moment in my day, oh my God, I defaulted back mm -hmm. to the old self. Forgive I went back. yourself, yeah. All right, no, so it's, not, it's not only forgive yourself, like there's a forgiving process, like shoot, but if you're truly playing the game, who cares, mm -hmm. right? You just go, oh God, let me brush myself off. Get back to get it. Back, yeah. Let me get back in my heart here. Let me get back in that place. Let me remember, let me get back in this energy and let's try it again. Let's try it again. Yes. And, and let's just keep the experiment going. Now, does that mean you have to be irresponsible? No, you still have to navigate with ethics and morality. You still have to have personal conviction. You still have to have a vision that's bigger than you and somehow that motivates you because not only you're doing it for selfish reasons, but to contribute to others in some way. Of course, there's going to be recognition and popularity and aggrandizement that goes with it. Money should be the side effect mm -hmm. of all that. The game should be so good of your vision, like that vision of the future, you have to keep alive in your mind. That should be the game. The you ones mean, that can keep that vision of the future in their mind now. Exactly. And, and have yeah. a personality. Even if, you're, even if your reality is falling apart, right. and that's happened to a lot of people. I mean, there are people that come through our work that are living in the back of their car. Right. And now they're, you know, th living very well or, or th sure. bankrupt. And now they're, you know, their companies are thriving. just thriving. Yeah. They just... They just never stopped believing in themselves because if you believe in yourself, it means you have to believe in possibility. And if you believe in possibility, you're gonna to have to believe in yourself. And so something really cool happens when you do this that I just discovered recently, just watching people at our week long events, um, you know, cause you gotta go all in, you gotta go all in. And it's seven days and it's a lot and it's super intense and there's times where you don't want to show up because I'm pushing mm. people across the river of change. There comes a moment where people keep showing up for themselves. They keep showing up for themselves in spite of the weather, in spite of their foot hurting, in spite of their bad dream, in spite of the whatever, their fight with or whoever, they keep showing up. They get really worthy to receive. They, it's no, they feel really worthy, like I am worthy to receive this gift. And the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving, right? So we got to get to that point because so many people who are in lack somehow don't feel worthy, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the abundance then becomes the sign that you finally become worthy. And in the, for the soul, it's not about the abundance. It's about mastering your worthiness. Mm. And the reflection Man. is the things that you accumulate. What's, the, what's the, the strategy to start believing we're worthy of receiving now? Is there Fill a your brain with as much knowledge as possible. And, and listen, my dad used to say this to me all the time. He'd say, wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second, just sit down with me here. If anybody else can do it, you could do it also. Mm. Well, let's just start there. So how did these people do it? Like, let's look at what they did. Right. All right, let's study. We are, this is a school of greatness. Yeah. Let's study greatness. What, what is greatness? Like an uncompromising will, invincibility, right. lead with their heart, adapt and make changes, let go of the past, give, you, give, give life, live it fully and completely and embrace it and enjoy it. I don't know, whatever, you get to write the script. Yeah. And you, you tell the story of your future instead of telling the story of your past, watch mm, what my happens. Gosh. What is, so how do we, should we be speaking to others about our future or should we be more keeping that to our mind and our bodies and kind of speaking it to ourselves? What happens when you say, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this yeah, and this yeah. is my future, does that's that a, actually that's hurt a great us? Question. Yeah, so I really don't leak it out. Yeah, I never yeah. leak it out. Because so if I'm working on you. something, yeah. I hold it, right? I don't wanna, I don't, I, I'll, when, it, when I know it's going to happen, that's when I'll say, hey, you guys, this is, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this, right? So it's more to yourself. Right, listen, you future. know when you know when you're changing? When you stop talking about it. That's when you know you're changing because you're out, you're out of the bleachers and you're on the playing field. Look, look, so many people come to our work, Lewis, and they say, I, I always believed that this was possible. All this information, it seems I've seen people heal them. Some people create well. Uh, I, I get it. I just didn't believe it would work for me. Mm. Oh, it's a big moment. It's a, it's a big moment. Now, now you are on the game. You're in the I'm in the playing field. You're, yes. you're out of the bleachers. Like, like, we had people stand on the stage. Someone stand on the stage this weekend in Denver. Just said, "My God, I, I, <laughs> I, 
I really believe that that um, this would work. I just I just didn't believe I could heal. I didn't believe. I really didn't believe it. I really didn't believe. She was a physician. Is a physician. I really didn't believe I could heal. Now, is it about the healing anymore? It's about overcoming the belief. Mm -hmm. Every day, she's got to make that decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision is causing her body to respond to her mind. And that's the moment she's rewriting the belief. And if, if she doesn't feel like it, don't expect anything to occur in your life. You got to come out of your resting state. You got you to make that choice. What do you, for the, all the people that go to your events, uh, and just in life, one of the biggest challenges people have is the consistency of doing these things. Yes. It's hard to actually go and try it once. No, That's but, but here's thing. the deal. How here's do you the stay deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Yeah. Let's just say you're in the experiment. Uh -huh. And now that belief is right in your face. I guarantee you that discomfort from that belief being right in your face is going to get you out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. and you're going to face off with it. There's an, there's an innate capacity that we have as human beings to want to overcome our limitations. It's in there, right? So the community that, that we have that does this work, they're not like, oh God, I gotta go create today. <laughs> That's not their game. The magic is so good. They show up because they don't want the magic to end. To go away, yeah. They don't, they, they're not doing it as a have to, to please God, do the right thing, be spiritual. None of that. None, it's not an obligation. It's something that they actually look forward to doing because the experiment in their life is creating all these wonderful opportunities. And, and there's plenty of people in our work that started new businesses that are sure. jam, they're right. jamming. Yeah, yeah. They're jamming. They're jamming. And, and, and they would never be victim to those circumstances, right? They just wouldn't let them, those circumstances define them, right? Yes. What defined them was the vision of the future. And that vision they had to keep alive and the emotion mm. was the energy that drove them right to it. Let's talk about a practical scenario where someone's in a relationship five, 10, 20 years, married or not married, and both parties have a pattern of defensiveness, of passive aggressiveness, of reacting when they don't like something. And then one person starts to transform and they do your work or they do meditation work and they really start to connect to their heart and their mind and they start healing the trauma of the past and the other person hasn't caught up yet. Mm. How does someone either inspire the other person to come on this train mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm and elevate their thoughts, or if they are unwilling to, is there a way to be in a happy relationship if your partner is still in reaction mode mm. more than you? Wow. Um, well, uh, again, speaking from my present state of ignorance, because I'm on a journey also. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, that one of the things that happens in, uh, when people start to come across information and knowledge that's really valuable, and they want to share it with the person next to them or share it with their lover, yeah. whatever. But if they're in a relationship for 15 years and they have a lot of emotional agreements yes. with people and things and they're in a lot of habits, we, we, we only uh, accept, believe, and surrender to information that's equal to our emotional state. So sometimes it bounces off the person. And if the person's really enthusiastic, then, the, then they're really like, whoa, what well, is up down. with you're yeah. changing in front of me. I don't like you this way. We, we had a thing going here. We could pick apart anybody or anything. <laughs> now you're not showing up equal to my memory. You're unpredictable. You're in the unknown. You're I'm unsafe. Fine. Yeah, you're the, the unknown is unsafe, right? So a lot of times mm. the enthusiasm is the first thing that starts creating con disconnection. But if the person goes, that's amazing. That's really cool. Say it again. Like they're ready to hear the information. Those people are going to evolve together, mm -hmm. right? If the person just kind of looks and says, oh my God, my wife's on the Kool-Aid or whatever it is. <laughs> this person is, you know, they, they changed their medication. I don't know what's happening with them. Then that person that is trying to explain it philosophically is just looking for someone to exchange information with. That person may not be the person. He may just like Sunday, Sunday football games and Monday night football and hanging out and drinking beer. And they fell in love when they were the same, mm -hmm. right? So now the next step is to find the person that you can exchange that information with because you want to understand it better so you can begin to use it. Now, mm. 
you have to stop preaching to that person. That's the first thing you have to do. In other words, show up happy. Show up transformed. Be the example. And then one of two things will happen. I tell my kids this all the time. If you're happy, then that person is going to want to get some of that. And they're going to ask you, all right, so what the, what, what the hell are you doing? Like, all of a sudden, you're like happy. They're either going to go, I want some of that, and they're going to evolve together. Now, if, they're, if they don't, and then you come down here and compromise yourself mm -hmm. to meet them on that level, they're going to take some of your energy, and you're going to be like, who am I? Resentful, I just, angry, yeah, all these things. You didn't, you didn't respond the way I wanted to. Now we're angry and we're back down here, right? Mm -hmm. But if you stay happy and they come up and they meet you there, then you're still happy. If you don't come down and you stay happy and they stay there and they move away, guess what? You stay happy. You're still happy. Yeah. Is this, so, so then people in relationships will compromise themselves out of, out of obligation, out of necessity, out of obedience, mm. out of programs, and at the end of the relationship, they don't even remember who they are because they compromised who or so many aspects of themselves. This is why you hear in a lot of people when they go through a breakup, they're like, oh, I, I lost myself of in course, this relationship. Because they're refining myself. They were changing, they were changing in a way that kept the relationship safe. Why do so many relationships do this in general? Because nobody they... wants to tell the truth. Mm. If you sat down and said, let's get vulnerable. Let's sit down, let's open our hearts, I have a bottle of wine, let's just, let's get vulnerable. Hey, I'm, a, I'm this, how are you doing? Like, what's really going on in there? Are you happy? And then be, be an adult, like, you're mm -hmm. unhappy, I'm unhappy too. You wanna try to stick this out? All right, well, if I were to say, if I could get in my heart and I was looking at myself, these are the things that make me unhappy that I want, with me, and that I wanna change. It's not only you, it's me, what I want to change. And the other person said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck too, I don't know how to change. I'm, you know, I'm doing this, I'm drinking more or whatever. I, mm -hmm. I gotta stop. And, and, and it, it's important enough for me, this relationship is important enough this for me matters. that I'm willing yeah. to make the change and let's figure out how to do it together. That, that to me, or I've done this, hey, are we, I can't feel it anymore. I can't feel that feeling anymore. I think I think it's time to move on. I love you, but it's turned. I've changed, and I still love you. But I gotta go. I mean, it's just different. We don't have the same yeah. interests anymore. We've grown in different directions, and and out of respect, let's let's do that together, yeah. right? So so those relationships still stay fertile. They're still wonderful. They're still you keep them alive, but they've transformed into mm -hmm. something else. It's the not telling the truth about how you really feel because would make you vulnerable and that may mean someone one-ups you or you may get uh, 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 shocked mm -hmm. or uh, uh, you know um, rejected in some way. I think the thing that the place in my life right now, I'm 37, the thing in my life and the relationship I'm in now, I'll tell my girlfriend often, I'm like, I'm so grateful that we're on this journey together and there's cultural differences. You've been with a Latin woman in the past, there's cultural differences, there's language differences, There's understand belief differences, all these things. The thing that I tell her is like, listen, I wanna be with you for as long as we can be together. If that's our lives, great, mm -hmm. I'm committed to you. But I'm also committed to myself. And if we're not able to line up yeah. consistently over time, and if it's we're both suffering, and we're yeah. unable to make it work, it's okay, it's okay. we can yeah. break up, it's yeah. okay. And this is the first time I've been in a place where I'm okay with her, and okay not with her. Yeah. And she's healthy. Well. Yeah. And so we were able to talk about these things from a healthy space, not needing it to mm -hmm. work out. Right. Because we're not lacking. Right, because of course, because you're, you, you feel differently. You, you've, you, you're using the love. Look, look, the truth is, if you truly are love, yes. then you will be challenged always to a greater level of love. Mm. And, and I have had enough mystical experiences where I thought, you just can't have any more love than this. <laughs> until I've had another experience and I'm like, wow, there's even more, right? So in love, in a loving relationship, I, I have three children and I only want the best for them. That's it. So if you truly love someone and you want the best for them and they need to go, you gotta love them. Yeah. Just as, just as long as it's, it's, they got that kind of clear agreement with each other, like, I'm gonna go. I just gotta go. And yeah, it's gonna hurt, but 
that's just that's if if there's truly love, you would want that for that person, their best, right? Yeah. So then. It's not something that we do that, that is a, a recipe. It's trial and error. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the number one thing that I've learned over the years in any relationship, it's about awareness. It's about who am I being in this moment? How conscious can I stay? How am I speaking? How am I acting? What is the tone of my voice? How much more can I give? How can I forgive? How can, how, if I'm having problems forgiving somebody, I would think about something that I may have done in my life that mm. I would want forgiveness for. Mm. And I would think about how I want to be forgiven and I would forgive that person in the same way that I would be forgiving myself. And in a sense, I am forgiving myself, right? So we have to see it as this illusion of separation, this illusion of three-dimensional reality. This is, this is the plane where we demonstrate love. I mean, yeah. we came from source, we came from singularity, we came from pure love and down into density, fooled by our senses into separation. Wow. And the survival hormones create more separation. They, they arouse us to put more attention on the illusion, on the objects, the hologram of three-dimensional reality, and we move further away from love. So, so, fear is not the opposite of love, it's the separation from it. Anger is not the opposite of love, it's the separation from love. Pain, suffering is not, the opposite of love, it's the separation from love. Mm. So then as people heal into wholeness by, by learning how to create coherence in their brain and heart, the side effect of that a lot of times are dramatic changes in their health and then more importantly, from that place, they could have been sexually abused, emotionally abused, physically abused. They will look at their entire past from that place and not want to change anything in their past because it brought them to that moment. Mm. And they'll see the lessons and they'll have compassion and forgiveness because they're at a different consciousness. Only when you're unhappy with yourself, unhappy with your life, are you gonna dig up the past and find the reason why you are that way. Mm. And 50% and, and, and of that story isn't even the truth. You embellish the story oh, right. to, to, to make it sound so hard that nobody can change. Well, I can't change, this is, it was way too hard. And the research on memory is majority of time people are telling a story that isn't even the truth. To me, they're reliving a miserable life they didn't even have, wow. only to reaffirm their emotional state. So you catch yourself in the midstream. You know, you catch yourself talking and feeling that you catch yourself, that's a victory. To me, that's a victory. Right. Because you're going to be in reaction. Of course. Right? We're going to have feelings and emotions. But the, you ask me, oh, so I react? Yeah, every day. Right. But I get better at it. And I always say, okay. If I was in that same circumstance with that same person, I got the same or similar news, how would Joe Dispenza show up more evolved? If I don't know the answer to that, I'm gonna find someone who had a similar experience, I'm gonna read what they did, wow. and I'm gonna rehearse that. I'm gonna rehearse it in my mind so much so that I'm priming my brain for the experience. Now I want it to happen so that I could, it's not about being right, it's not about being, any of those, it's, it's really about my evolution. So then, so then that victory to me creates more wholeness. Yeah. And so that more wholeness means I'm less lack in separation. If I'm lack, less lack in separation, then I'm relaxed in the present moment. And that's the, that's the beauty of being alive is that we want the moment to last. We want to be so present. It's so good. Mm. We don't want to leave it. So love, people, people want love, but what's the sponsoring thought behind that? They want joy, that love brings them joy. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. People want abundance, but they don't really want abundance, they want freedom. That's what they really want. They want to be able to do whatever they want. They want to have freedom. Yes. You know, people want a mystical experience. No, they want to be blown away. They want to feel awe. They, they want to be in awe of life. People want to be healed. Uh, no, they, they want to be whole. Mm. They want to feel wholeness. Uh, they want to feel whole again. So if you're looking for the reason uh, why you want certain things, you want it for an emotion. The emotion is the, is the payoff from the experience. It it's the payoff. And then we get to experience it with our senses and it's greater than we imagined. 
And I'm telling you, when, when, when the reality starts organizing itself to reflect your energy and it starts showing up it's in your life, what kind of feeling do you feel when you start seeing those synchronicities? You feel excitement, joy, inspiration. That's the energy you're going to use to create the next one. And so yes. people in our work, you know, this is the thing that I'm a pr proud That's of. Why synchronicities happen daily when you're Because in your energy is synchronized. Yeah. Your energy is synchronized to a future. So the future that you're seeing in your mind before it happened and emotionally embracing so much so that your brain and body look like it's already happened. Well, if it looks physically like it's already happened, relax, because it's going to come to you. Mm. So then people in this work do the work every day, and that's the thing I'm the most proud of, not because I want them to do it out of obligation or to please God or do the right thing or whatever else, whatever the programs have been for, for thousands of years. They don't want the magic to end. Mm -hmm. They just like, I don't know what this is, but I'm having these incredible lucid moments. I'm, I can't believe I just got this opportunity and wow, this is happening. And there, every synchronicity does what? It creates the energy and the belief that there could be more, but they're not trying to control it. They're not trying to predict it. In fact, it's, it's none of their business how it happens or when it happens. That's, if you can predict how it's gonna happen, that's the known. Yeah. The unknown is like, I'm so happy, I would never try to control it. I'm not gonna leave the present moment. And that's when you're the vortex, you know, to experiences. And mm. so that's the difference between creating as source or praying as source or creating or praying to source. Separation is begging, ah. trying. Now, you are, you are connected, you feel divine. You feel you are the source. You are connected to source. Yes. And so this place, is the bridge to that. Once it's here, then there are, there, are, there are emotions and energies and frequencies that are just inevitable. You, you, can't, you can't describe how much love that is or yeah. the feeling that you feel. Do emotions create thoughts or do thoughts create emotions? Both. So think about this. Some people wake up in the morning. Uh -huh. Your brain is a record of the past. Yeah. The first thing they do is they think about their problems. Those <laughs> yeah. problems are memories that are etched in the brain that are connected to certain people, certain objects, certain things at a certain time and place. The moment they wake up in the morning and they think about their problems, they're thinking in the past. Mm. If you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, well, you're already in your past. Every one of those problems, since we've experienced it, has an emotion associated with it. So then all of a sudden, they start feeling unhappy the moment they feel unhappy. Now the body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. Huh. So now that once they go, oh. Say it one more time. Thoughts are the language of the brain, feelings are the language of the body. Mm. So the moment they start feeling those feelings, now their body's in the past. So now they, they get back and they, they started off with a clean slate. They didn't feel anything and then they're like, I'm back to feeling unhappy. Okay, I'm back to myself again. Ah. So because they'd rather feel unhappy than feel, not feel anything. So naturally, the void of that emotion is influencing, the body's influencing the mind, the brain to think, so it produces the chemicals for it to feel. Uh -huh. Some people just wake up in the morning and they don't feel anything, and then all of a sudden they just look for that feeling. They just, some people need a thought to do it, some people can just bring up the feeling, right? Wow. So then they cling to that emotion because at least it's the known. Mm -hmm. So some people, have emotions that influence thoughts. Some people are more analytical, they have thoughts that influence feelings, but it's a loop, right? It's, it's that cycle of thinking and feeling. What's the formula to get out of that quickly? You keep mentioning the formula, like there's a formula, if, if that's yeah. happening, and I know we've had thousands of people that go through your books and your med uh, audio meditations, I think you have some new ones coming out here soon, and they've been to your workshops, which I think Go to the workshop because it's going to be a game changer. I can't wait till I can go. But I keep inviting you. Guess I what? Know, you can't happen. come anymore. You're not allowed to come. <laughs> I'm okay. coming. No, you can't come now. So maybe this will get him to come. <laughs> exactly. Now I'm there. Uh, what is a formula, like a one to two minute formula, when someone notices, oh, I'm feeling something, and then my thoughts are uh, supporting that feeling, and I'm just staying in this loop? What's the one or two minute formula that they could just implement in the morning, at night, whenever? Yeah. to help them. Well, I'm gonna give you two examples, okay? Because there's not just one way to do this. Of course, um, yeah. um, So, if you're, if you're truly in the business of change or creating your life, that's a big responsibility, yeah. right? I mean, like, 
we, we, we ran our event, I said to the audience, okay, nobody, nobody forced you to come here, right? You came here on your own. You took the risk in coming here. By coming here, you also agree that you create your reality, mm. that you're responsible for yourself and your life. So if something happens to you, you can't blame anybody because of that. It's your responsibility to take care of you, right? So then the fundamental question is, and I ask myself this all the time, at what point do I stop believing that I create my life? At what point? When things go bad, then all of a sudden it's, I didn't create that. That person is doing it to me, right? So if we can, if we can wire that in our brains, right, that our reaction and response to an environmental condition is causing us to go back to the past. Mm -hmm. That's what the emotion is. The familiar emotion is the past. And I'm on the journey and I catch myself doing that. If I'm truly in the practice every day and I can cultivate a feeling, not, not, not on the spot then, that you, you, you're not prepared. Your meditation is the preparation of mind and body for this. So I don't get up from my meditation until I'm in love with life. I don't, mm. I don't create anything that's gonna be unlimited until I feel unlimited. And I, in that space. And if I'm practicing feeling unlimited every day, I'm practicing connecting to the emotions of my future, I'm, I'm out of the bleachers and I'm on the field. Mm. If you're in the bleachers and you're trying to not react to people in, in circumstances, you don't have the practice or the skill set on how to create that emotion because you haven't been practicing creating it. And why do we close our eyes and do it? Because the environment is so seductive. Why do we sit still and not move? Because you're gonna wanna get up and pee and eat and have a cup of coffee and <laughs> feel. So, so now you're telling your body, hey, stay. I'm gonna feed you. Yeah, you're gonna take a shower. You're gonna get coffee. You can play with your cell phone. Right. You can text, you can talk trash. You can do anything you want. But right now, you're not the mind. Mm. I'm the mind and you're gonna sit and stay till I'm done. And when I condition you to the emotions of the future, and I get a very clear image of who I'm no. going to be this day, and I'm not gonna get up until I feel that way, I guarantee you, you're gonna come up against all those unconscious thoughts. They're gonna come up right there. I, I want people to, I want them to see it. I want them to become so familiar with it so conscious, if they wouldn't go unconscious, they wouldn't let that thought, I can't ever slip by their mm. awareness unchecked. They've done the work in the beginning of the day. They suppress those circuits in the brain and nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. You're, you're breaking down the old personality. Ooh. And so you say, ah, oh, your body wants to get up, I gotta pee, I wanna have a couple, I'm gonna check my, and you, you watch your body wanna get up and you go, hey, 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 get over here. <laughs> you, you get back into this present moment. And wow. you, every time you do that, it's a victory. You're executing a will that's greater than an unconscious program. And most people lose their free will to a program because they do the same thing today as they did yesterday. Their body's on autopilot and it's dragging them into the same future habitually based on what they did in the past. So now you're sitting there and it's just a little uncomfortable and you wanna quit and your body, and you go, no. And you get over here and you bring it back. Now some people say, I can't meditate, but really they're actually doing it right. That's a victory too. Yeah. And then you do that and you start watching how you're training your body back into the present moment. Then it's your body says, well, you know, Lewis, it's, uh, <laughs> this, it's 8, 8.30 in the morning. This is usually when you watch the news and throw a tirade and get angry. Right, And I'm was, And you're which, sitting here with your eyes closed and you're off schedule. So why don't we just get agitated about anything? So the body starts trying to create images in your mind. So you remember your ex, you remember your problems. So you could feel that agitation. What if you watched your body do that and you said, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna give my power away to the past or that person or that circumstance in my life. You get that body back in the present moment. You lower the volume to that emotion. Whew, that's a victory. You're telling the body it's no longer the mind that you're the mind. Now, that kind of work is tedious in the beginning, but I watch people because when I have them do that, it starts stretching their boundaries. Mm -hmm. The known self, that little box, starts to move into the unknown and they survive. And all of a sudden they're more relaxed in the present moment, the unknown, and they start feeling more satisfied. So now they're more ready to create. So the preparation for the day mm. 
is to remind yourself of who you no longer want to be. Ah. To know thyself, to become so familiar with, the word meditation means to become familiar with. So conscious of your unconscious programs, you're not going to go unconscious. Why? Because you did, you did battle today with that personality that's creating the same personal reality. And if your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how mm. you feel, and you want to create a new personal reality, then you've got to change your personality. And that's going to mean then you're going to become so conscious of those unconscious programs that you're no longer the program. You're the consciousness observing the program. Disentangling from that is not easy. That's why most people won't do it. That's why they get on their cell phone and say, let me just create a little dopamine by just seeing if I got a text from somebody I like. You're, mm. and then your phone's over there and you're no longer regulating with something outside of you. This is, this is game time. So then if you said, what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? Hmm? With my attention and my intention, I'm going to make that the loudest voice in my head. Mm. And if you keep firing and wiring, that hardware is going to become a software program and it's going to be a new voice. Right. It's going to, you installed it. No, no magic there. And if you said, <laughs> hey, listen, I sucked yesterday with my staff meeting. I was off. I want another shot at it. How would greatness show up? Mm. School of greatness. Yeah. How would greatness show up for the staff meeting? I got another shot. I got 10 fingers, 10 toes. I'm alive. My heart's beating. I didn't fail. I got another shot today. All right. What, what do I know about myself that I can do? The act of closing your eyes and rehearsing who you're going to be God, so is installing more hardware. The brain's going to look like you already did it. Now it's no longer in the past. It's primed for the future. Keep doing it, and it's going to become a software program, and you're going to start looking pretty great. People are going to go like, wow. Feeling great. You're going to, you're going to demonstrate greatness. Yeah. Well, but there's no magic there, because you're going to think, what is greatness? Okay, I like what this person said. I like what that person said. I like what I read here. I love my experience of when I've demonstrated. And the frontal lobe is going to create a beautiful, beautiful understanding of what, how to evolve your experience. And when you, just no different than learning how to dance, learning a sport, learning a lines if you're an actor or an actress, a, a musician, you, you rehearse all the time. And the rehearsal is actually priming the brain for the experience. So now mm. your brain is ready for the day. It's different than just going, oh, I'm not gonna react to my boss. Well, well you haven't done the work to come up with how to, how to overcome that and then what did you install so you have circuit, you have raw materials to, to use. Now here's yeah. the hardest part. Can you teach your body emotionally what it would feel like if you, if you arrived at your future? And, and can you say, I'm not gonna get up until I feel that way? Now this is, mm. this is good work here because you'll have to come up with that emotion and get beyond the shame, the guilt, the unworthiness, the pain, the suffering, and this is battle. This is battle because your brain is going to keep going to something that's going to want to make you feel that way. Then the analytical mind is going to say, you can't do this, it's too hard, why don't you quit? And that's where everybody stops. But right on the other side of that is love. Mm. Right on the other side of that is gratitude. Right on the other side of that is freedom, right? So then if the person's willing to go a little further and practice a way to do that, and they could get in touch with that emotion, and they can feel it. And when I feel it, I always say, and usually when it's really good, I say, remember this feeling. Memorize this feeling. Memorize it. I want to... Make a I, snapshot of that feeling. I want to I wanna know, I want to be able to bring this feeling up on command. So I'll let it go. Mm. And then I'll go back and say, let me see if I can do it again. Why am I trying to do it again? To remember. Remembering is creating the circuitry to be able to produce it again. It's going to become a skill. Now, I have something to walk into my condition in my life where I'm reacting. And now I have a plan. I've primed my brain and body to the future instead of the past. I've suppressed the past. Yeah. So now I have, I'm, I'm closing my eyes, disconnecting from the environment, overcoming my body, not thinking about the predictable future, the familiar past and time. I'm in the present moment. I'm ready to create. Why? Because I want to present myself to the world as an evolved version of yesterday. Real quick, before you go to the next, I hear a lot of therapists will mention we should not suppress emotions. I'm hearing you mention just there suppressing the past. No, I would never say suppress. I would say, at what point are you done feeling that emotion? Gotcha. You want to so keep feeling feel it? Go, if, if you're not doing wrong. anything wrong. You're just yeah, taking yeah. too long. I mean, gotcha, like, gotcha. I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to not feel an emotion. I feel emotions, but again, I'm just going to move through them. I'm a super passionate person. And if I'm yeah. going in, I'm going all in. I'm not going half, halfway. But when I feel and I can catch myself, 
That's pretty cool. Gotcha. Because yes. now I can change it. No one, no one, nothing is doing that to me. I'll feel it. I'm not sitting there going. I'm not doing that. I'm not, there's no tool set there. I'm just. I'm. 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 I'm steeping in the emotion. That's not it. I am saying, okay, I'm angry. In the in this moment in eternity, Joe Dispenza, what do you got? What do you got? This is the moment you're going to remember because mm -hmm. people who heal. People who have transcendental moments, people who break through, people who have the, the wealth, the freedom, when they look back at their life and they see all the days they chose themselves to show up for their meditation, mm. when they look back at those past moments, they're not looking back at the easy meditations. Mm -hmm. They're not falling in love with the person who had the good meditation. They're, they're falling in love with the person who sat in the fire. They're, they're, they remember those moments where they were like, I didn't give up on me. I believed in myself. I believed there was something on the other side of this feeling. I stuck with it. And all of a sudden, it starts to change. And for some people, it takes a little longer than others, but they're on it. Mm -hmm. And so then when they look back at their past and they see all those times that it was hard, and they, they went a little further, they're gonna fall in love with that yeah. person. And now, their future self, who's already transformed, is drawing their past self to them in love. There's, that's, how, that's how reality so you, is. So our our future self in the future or no there, in the there's moment. a future you right that's already exists you just got to get there right and he's he's in love with you and the mm -hmm. only way you're going to get there is by you being in love with you and being in love in the past yeah but so then what is love then so then huh. people think they confuse love with pleasure yes. like a manicure or shopping spree that's not love that's pleasure mm -hmm. and, and the more whole we are, the less need for pleasure we have. You sit in the fire. I watched 1,025 people last week transform themselves. Mm. In the beginning, I was trying to find the door. I, they were, they were, I was bouncing off them, I just wouldn't quit. And then they started doing the work. They came up against themselves, they got frustrated, they got impatient, I kept reminding them. Their brain's going into high beta, their arousal is driving them further out of balance, and they started tempering the animal. And they started, I took them a little further and they sat through the fire. And all of a sudden it wasn't about the mystical experience. It wasn't about the wealth. It was about learning the formula. It wasn't about what they wanted. It was about overcoming themselves. They're learning the formula on how in that moment, if they could just relax and keep practicing, that little box begins to expand. And mm. now there's more, more, more room for them to relax in the unknown. I stretched them outside of the known and they survived. And I keep stretching them and all of a sudden, they're more present. And so they wanted, they wanted to come to the edge in the next meditation and go a little further. It was no longer me saying you gotta go. They, were, they wanted the edge. They wanted to see what was standing in the way between them and their new relationship, mm -hmm. them and their healing. What, what was that thing? that I want to remove, I'm going to, if not now, when, right? So they wanted to take it on because they, they forgot about their cell phones. We did it during the week of election, so nobody would care about us. They, they didn't <laughs> care about the election. They didn't care about wow. any disease. They were immersed and, and, and they retreated from their lives. Now, back to your question. I guarantee you those people, when they face circumstances in their life now, they're ready for their environment. In mm. fact, they've lowered the volume to so many of those emotions. When people slash out at them or do things, they're gonna go, oh, come here. Are you hurting? Get over here, right, I'll right. give you a hug. Not like, oh, you know, they're not gonna do that. They're gonna be like, come here, I love you. Get over here, yeah. are you okay? It's just, they're not, there's not that anymore. They, they, they kinda, they, they're kinda ready. So, mm. so the formula then, to answer your question, <laughs> is brain and heart coherence. And when you're in stress and you're in survival, when you're in danger, the arousal of the stress hormones creates a heighten, heightening of our senses and we become materialists and we narrow our focus on the material world and that's reality now. And when mm. we start trying to control reality and predict it and we have the perception that things are getting worse, all of a sudden we're shifting our attention to one person, to another person, to another problem, to another thing, to another text. And every one of those things, there's a neurological network in the brain. So the arousal of the stress hormones causes the brain to start firing incoherently. And now there's no energy in the brain because the incoherence is diminishing energy. It's waves that are canceling each other out. The brain goes into like this quiescence of no activity, but very little, very little performance. So then we said, okay, 
Let's teach people how to take their attention off of everything known in this memory bank of the known self, the autobiographical self, the artifact of the past. Mm. Let's teach them how to go from a narrow object focus on anything material that's known in this three-dimensional reality to broadening their focus, mm. to putting their attention on energy, nothing, space, and going from a convergent focus to a divergent focus and opening their focus, we started noticing that the brain started to synchronize. The different compartments started to unify and the brain started functioning in a more holistic state and the person started feeling more chilled, more poised, more clear. And what sinks in the brain mm. links in the brain. Mm. So you start seeing this kind of integration. And we can call people on the stage now and I can say, would you show the audience on a brain scan how to go in the gamma? Give me one second. Boom, they go right in the gamma. Wow. Can you show them how to go into alpha coherent brainwave patterns? I can, give me a minute. It's alpha, uh, like negative that, state or? Alpha is like that creative state. Oh, when, creative when, state. The, when the brain starts slowing down analytical you know, wow, processing. Okay. So gamma then, is what? It's like super consciousness. That's like, that's the, like the, that's the big stuff. Yeah, that's, that's the like, highest level that your brain can go into. Yeah, it's a kind of a very fast frequency, but our gamma frequencies that we record in our work is so coherent. Like, let me see how I could say this. When you're in beta, right? We're in beta right now. Mm -hmm your brain is busy integrating all this information. What I'm saying, what you're feeling, the temperature in the room, the lights, your back, you know, everything else. Your brain's got to figure all this out. It's got to create meaning between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. If I said to you, Lewis, I forgot to tell you you're going to take a test today, you would perk up a little bit more, right? The light bulb would get a little brighter. Yeah. It's mid-range beta. But when you're in high beta, that's when you're really, really out of balance. When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're impatient, when you're vigilant, you know, that's, the brain is in a very, very high, heightened state. And that's that, high beta. High beta, that's. It's when you're in a negative state. Yeah, exactly, you're in survival. And people don't think they can control that. So they start analyzing in that state and they make their brain worse. They get overly focused, overly analytical. And now mm. you gotta get beyond that analytical mind to get into the operating system to change those unwanted habits and behaviors. So when you disconnect from your environment and you close your eyes and there's less stimulation coming mm. in, we play music in the background, you're not eating, you're not smelling, you're not tasting, you're not feeling, there's less sensory information. Naturally, this mechanism starts to slow down and so there's less information yeah. and you go into alpha and you cross the analytical mind. And what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind, so now, you're suppressing the, 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 the analytical mind that's saying you can, it's too hard, the voice goes away. And in alpha now, we're not looking for any kind of alpha, we're looking for coherent alpha. So as they open their focus and they sense space, the act of sensing and feeling mm. causes them to stop thinking and analyzing. So you start seeing energy leave the neocortex, right? If they do it really well and the body starts to fall asleep or it feels so comfortable that it can rest in the present moment and let it almost fall asleep and you're still conscious and awake. Now you're in theta. Mm. Now that's a that's hypnotic your, state. Your body's like vibrating almost. Yeah, the, the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is wide open. It's very programmable. Thinking about being positive is actually creating the negative problem because you're not paying attention when you're thinking about being positive. So th th this is a whole issue. People have a feeling that they can change, but they have no effort. They don't want to get in the game because they feel it's, you know, it's just too much time and it doesn't work.